Letter thirty four Hakodate Yezo. I am enjoying Hakodate so much that though my tour is all planned and my arrangements are made, I linger on from day to day. There has been an unpleasant eclaircissement about Ito. You will remember that I engaged him without a character, and that he told both Lady Parks and me that, after I had done so, his former master, Mr. Marys, asked him to go back to him, to which he had replied that he had a contract with a lady. Mr. Marys is here, and I now find that he had a contract with Ito, by which Ito bound himself to serve him as long as he required him, for seven dollars a month but that, hearing that I offered twelve dollars, he ran away from him and entered my service with a lie. Mr. Marys had been put to the greatest inconvenience by his defection, and has been hindered greatly in completing his botanical collection, for Ito is very clever, and he had not only trained him to dry plants successfully, but he could trust him to go away for two or three days and collect seeds. I am very sorry about it. He says that Ito was a bad boy when he came to him, but he thinks that he cured him of some of his faults, and that he has served me faithfully. I have seen Mr. Marys at the consuls, and have arranged that, after my Yezo tour is over, Ito shall be returned to his rightful master, who will take him to China and Formosa for a year and a half, and who, I think, will look after his well-being in every way. Dr. and Mrs. Hepburn, who are here, heard a bad account of the boy after I began my travels and were uneasy about me, but except for this original lie I have no fault to find with him, and his Shinto creed has not taught him any better. When I paid him his wages this morning he asked me if I had any fault to find, and I told him of my objection to his manners, which he took in very good part and promised to amend them. But he added, mine are just missionary manners. Yesterday I dined at the consulate to meet Count Diesbach of the French legation, Mr. von Siebold of the Austrian legation, and Lieutenant Kreitner of the Austrian army, who start tomorrow on an exploring expedition in the interior, intending to cross the sources of the rivers which fall into the sea on the southern coast and measure the heights of some of the mountains. They are well found in food and claret, but take such a number of pack-ponies with them that I predict that they will fail, and that I, who have reduced my luggage to forty-five pounds, will succeed. I hope to start on my long-projected tour tomorrow. I have planned it for myself with the confidence of an experienced traveller, and look forward to it with great pleasure as a visit to the Aborigines is sure to be full of novel and interesting experiences. Goodbye for a long time. Letter 35 Ginzai Noma, Yezo, August 17 I am once again in the wilds. I am sitting outside an upper room built out almost over a lonely lake, with wooded points purpling and still shadows deepening in the sinking sun. A number of men are dragging down the nearest hillside, the carcass of a bear which they have just dispatched with spears. There is no village, and the busy clatter of the cicada and the rustle of the forest are the only sounds which float on the still evening air. The sunset colours are pink and green, on the tinted water lie the waxen cups of great water-lilies, and above the wooded heights the pointed, craggy, and altogether naked summit of the volcano of Komunotaki flushes red in the sunset. Not the least of the charms of the evening is that I am absolutely alone, having ridden the eighteen miles from Hakodate without Ito or an attendant of any kind, have unsaddled my own horse, and by means of much politeness and a dexterous use of Japanese substantives, have secured a good room and supper of rice, eggs, and black beans for myself, and a mash of beans for my horse, which, as it belongs to the Kaitakushi and has the dignity of iron shoes, is entitled to special consideration. I am not yet off the beaten track, but my spirits are rising with the fine weather, the drier atmosphere, and the freedom of Yezo. 
Yezo is to the main island of Japan what Tipperary is to an Englishman, Berra to a Scotchman, away down in Texas to a New Yorker, in the rough, little known and thinly peopled, and people can locate all sorts of improbable stories here without much fear of being found out, of which the Ainos and the misdeeds of the ponies furnish the staple, and the queer doings of men and dogs, and adventures with bears, wolves and salmon, the embroidery. Nobody comes here without meeting with something queer, and one or two tumbles either with or from his horse. Very little is known of the interior, except that it is covered with forest matted together by lianas, and with an undergrowth of scrub bamboo impenetrable except to the axe, varied by swamps equally impassable, which give rise to hundreds of rivers well stocked with fish. The glare of volcanoes is seen in different parts of the island. The forests are the hunting grounds of the Ainos, who are complete savages in everything but their disposition, which is said to be so gentle and harmless that I may go among them with perfect safety. Kindly interest has been excited by the first foray made by a lady into the country of the Aborigines, and Mr. Euston, the consul, has worked upon the powers that be, with such good effect that the governor has granted me a shomon, a sort of official letter or certificate, giving me a right to obtain horses and coolies everywhere at the government rate of six sen a ri, with a prior claim to accommodation at the houses kept up for officials on their circuits, and to help and assistance from officials generally and the governor has further telegraphed to the other side of Volcano Bay, desiring the authorities to give me the use of the government kuruma as long as I need it, and to detain the steamer to suit my convenience. With this document, which enables me to dispense with my passport, I shall find travelling very easy, and I am very grateful to the consul for procuring it for me. Here, where rice and tea have to be imported, there is a uniform charge at the yadoyas of thirty sen a day, which includes three meals, whether you eat them or not. Horses are abundant, but are small and are not up to heavy weights. They are entirely unshod, and, though their hoofs are very shallow and grow into turned-up points and other singular shapes, they go over rough ground with facility at a scrambling run of over four miles an hour, following a leader called a front horse. If you don't get a front horse and try to ride in front, you find that your horse will not stir till he has another before him, and then you are perfectly helpless as he follows the movements of his leader without any reference to your wishes. There are no mago, a man rides the front horse and goes at whatever pace you please, or, if you get a front horse, you may go without any one. Horses are cheap and abundant. They drive a number of them down from the hills every morning into corrals in the villages and keep them there till they are wanted. Because they are so cheap, they are very badly used. I have not seen one yet without a sore back produced by the harsh pack saddle rubbing up and down the spine as the loaded animals are driven at a run. They are mostly very poor looking. As there was some difficulty about getting a horse for me, the consul sent one of the Kaitakushi saddle horses, a handsome, lazy animal, which I rarely succeeded in stimulating into a heavy gallop. Leaving Ito to follow with the baggage, I enjoyed my solitary ride and the possibility of choosing my own pace very much, though the choice was only between a slow walk and the lumbering gallop aforesaid. I met strings of horses loaded with deer hides, and overtook other strings loaded with sake and manufactured goods, and in each case had a fight with my sociably inclined animal. In two villages I was interested to see that the small shops contained lucifer matches, cotton umbrellas, boots, brushes, clocks, slates and pencils, engravings in frames, kerosene lamps and red and green blankets, all but the last, which are unmistakable British shoddy, being Japanese imitations of foreign manufactured goods, more or less cleverly executed. 
the road goes uphill for fifteen miles and after passing nanai a trim europeanized village in the midst of fine crops one of the places at which the government is making acclimatization and other agricultural experiments it fairly enters the mountains and from the top of a steep hill there is a glorious view of hakodate head looking like an island in the deep blue sea and from the top of a higher hill looking northward a magnificent view of the volcano with its bare pink summit rising above three lovely lakes densely wooded these are the flushed scores and outbreaks of bare rock for which i sighed amidst the smothering greenery of the main island and the silver gleam of the lakes takes away the blindness from the face of nature it was delicious to descend to the water's edge in the dewy silence amidst balsamic odours to find not a clattering grey village with its monotony but a single irregularly built house with lovely surroundings it is a most displeasing road for most of the day sides with deep corrugations and in the middle a high causeway of earth whose height is being added to by hundreds of creels of earth brought on ponies backs it is supposed that carriages and wagons will use this causeway but a shying horse or a bad driver would overturn them as it is at present the road is only passable for pack horses owing to the number of broken bridges i passed strings of horses laden with sake going into the interior the people of yezo drink freely and the poor ainos outrageously on the road i dismounted to rest myself by walking up hill and the saddle being loosely girthed the gear behind it dragged it round and under the body of the horse and it was too heavy for me to lift on its back again when i had led him for some time two japanese with a string of pack horses loaded with deer hides met me and not only put the saddle on again but held the stirrup while i remounted and bowed politely when i went away who could help liking such a courteous and kindly people mori volcano bay monday even ginzainoma was not paradise after dark and i was actually driven to bed early by the number of mosquitoes ito is in an excellent humour on this tour like me he likes the freedom of the hokkaido he is much more polite and agreeable also and very proud of the governor's shomon with which he swaggers into hotels and transport offices i never get on so well as when he arranges for me saturday was grey and lifeless and the ride of seven miles here along a sandy road through monotonous forest and swamp with the volcano on one side and low wooded hills on the other was wearisome and fatiguing i saw five large snakes all in a heap and a number more twisting through the grass there are no villages but several very poor tea-houses and on the other side of the road long sheds with troughs hollowed like canoes out of the trunks of trees containing horse food here nobody walks and the men ride at a quick run sitting on the tops of their pack saddles with their legs crossed above their horses necks and wearing large hats like coal scuttle bonnets the horses are infested with ticks hundreds upon one animal sometimes and occasionally they become so mad from the irritation that they throw themselves suddenly on the ground and roll over load and rider i saw this done twice the ticks often transfer themselves to the riders mori is a large ramshackle village near the southern point of volcano bay a wild dreary-looking place on a sandy shore with a number of joroyas and disreputable characters several of the yadoyas are not respectable but i rather like this one and it has a very fine view of the volcano which forms one point of the bay mori has no anchorage though it has an unfurnished pier three hundred forty five feet long the steam ferry across the mouth of the bay is here and there is a very difficult bridle track running for nearly one hundred miles round the bay besides and a road into the interior but it is a forlorn decayed place 
Last night the inn was very noisy, as some travellers in the next room to mine hired geishas, who played, sang, and danced till two in the morning, and the whole party imbibed sake freely. In this comparatively northern latitude the summer is already waning. The seeds of the blossoms which were in their glory when I arrived are ripe, and here and there a tinge of yellow on a hillside, or a scarlet spray of maple, heralds the glories and the coolness of autumn. Yubetsu, Yezo A loud yell of, Steamer! coupled with the information that she should not wait one minute, broke in upon go and everything else, and in a boiling sun we hurried down to the pier, and with a heap of Japanese, who filled two scows, were put on board a steamer not bigger than a large decked steam lounge, where the natives were all packed into a covered hole, and I was conducted with much ceremony to the forecastle, a place at the bow five feet square, full of coils of rope, shut in, and left to solitude and dignity, and the stare of eight eyes, which perseveringly glowered through the windows. The steamer had been kept waiting for me on the other side for two days, to the infinite disgust of two foreigners who wished to return to Hakodate, and to mine. It was a splendid day, with foam crests on the wonderfully blue water, and the red ashes of the volcano, which forms the south point of the bay, glowed in the sunlight. This wretched steamer, whose boilers are so often sick that you can never be relied upon, is the only means of reaching the new capital without taking a most difficult and circuitous route. To continue the pier and put a capable good steamer on the ferry would be a useful expenditure of money. The breeze was strong and in our favour, but even with this it took us six weary hours to steam twenty-five miles, and it was eight at night before we reached the beautiful and almost landlocked bay of Mororan, with steep wooded sides and deep water close to the shore, deep enough for the foreign ships of war which occasionally anchor there, much to the detriment of the town. We got off in overcrowded sampans, and several people fell into the water, much to their own amusement. The servants from the different yadoyas go down to the jetty to tout for guests with large paper lanterns, and the effect of these, one above another, waving and undulating with their soft-coloured light, was as bewitching as the reflection of the stars in the motionless water. Mororan is a small town very picturesquely situated on the steep shore of a most lovely bay, with another height richly wooded above it, with shrines approached by flights of stone stairs, and behind this hill there is the first Aino village along this coast. The long, irregular street is slightly picturesque, but I was impressed both with the unusual sight of loafers and with the dissolute look of the place, arising from the number of joroyas and from the number of yadoyas that are also haunts of the vicious. I could only get a very small room in a very poor and dirty inn, but there were no mosquitoes, and I got a good meal of fish. On sending to order horses, I found that everything was arranged for my journey. The governor has sent his card early, to know if there were anything I should like to see or do, but as the morning was grey and threatening, I wished to push on, and at 9.30 I was in the kuruma at the inn door. I call it the Kuruma, because it is the only one, and is kept by the government for the conveyance of hospital patients. I sat there uncomfortably and patiently for half an hour, my only amusement being the flirtations of Ito with a very pretty girl. Loiterers assembled, but no one came to draw the vehicle, and by degrees the dismal truth leaked out that the three coolies who had been impressed for the occasion had all absconded and that four policemen were in search of them. I walked on in a dawdling way up the steep hill which leads from the town, met Mr. Akboshi, a pleasant young Japanese surveyor, who spoke English and stigmatized Mororan as the worst place in Yezo, and, after fuming for two hours at the waste of time, was overtaken by Ito with the horses in a boiling rage. 
They're the worst and wickedest coolies in all Japan, he stammered. Two more ran away, and now three are coming, and have got paid for four, and the first three who ran away got paid, and the expressman's so ashamed for a foreigner, and the governor's in a furious rage. Except for the loss of time, it made no difference to me, but when the kuruma did come up, the runners were three such ruffianly-looking men, and were dressed so wildly in bark cloth, that, in sending Ito on twelve miles to secure relays, I sent my money along with him. These men, though there were three instead of two, never went out of a walk, and, as if on purpose, took the vehicle over every stone and into every rut, and kept up a savage chorus of He Sha, He Sora, the whole time, as if they were pulling stone carts. There are really no runners out of Hakodate, and the men don't know how to pull, and hate doing it. Mororan Bay is truly beautiful from the top of the ascent. The coast scenery of Japan generally is the loveliest I have ever seen, except that of a portion of windward Hawaii, and this yields in beauty to none. The irregular grey town with a grey temple on the height above straggles round the little bay on a steep wooded terrace, Hills densely wooded, and with a perfect entanglement of large-leaved trailers, descend abruptly to the water's edge. The festoons of the vines are mirrored in the still waters, and above the dark forest and beyond the gleaming sea rises the red, peaked top of the volcano. Then the road dips abruptly to sandy swellings, rising into bold headlands here and there, and for the first time I saw the surge of five thousand miles of unbroken ocean break upon the shore. Glimpses of the Pacific, an uncultivated, swampy level quite uninhabited, and distant hills mainly covered with forest, made up the landscape till I reached Horobetsu, a mixed Japanese and Aino village built upon the sand near the sea. In these mixed villages, the Ainos are compelled to live at a respectful distance from the Japanese, and frequently outnumber them, as at Horobetsu, where there are 47 Aino and only 18 Japanese houses. The Aino village looks larger than it really is, because nearly every house has a kura, raised six feet from the ground by wooden stilts. When I am better acquainted with the houses, I shall describe them, at present I will only say that they do not resemble the Japanese houses so much as the Polynesian, as they are made of reeds very neatly tied upon a wooden framework. They have small windows and roofs of a very great height, and steep pitch, with the thatch in a series of very neat frills, and the ridge poles covered with reeds and ornamented. The coast Ainos are nearly all engaged in fishing, but at this season the men hunt deer in the forest. On this coast there are several names compounded with Betsu or Petsu, the Aino for a river, such as Horobetsu, Yubetsu, Mombetsu, etc. I found that Ito had been engaged for a whole hour in a violent altercation, which was caused by the transport agent refusing to supply runners for the kuruma, saying that no one in Horobetsu would draw one, but on my producing the shomon, I was at once started on my journey of sixteen miles with three Japanese lads, Ito riding on to Shiraoi to get my room ready. I think that the transport offices in Yezo are in government hands. In a few minutes three Ainos ran out of a house, took the kuruma, and went the whole stage without stopping. They took a boy and three saddled horses along with them to bring them back, and rode and hauled alternately, two youths always attached to the shafts and a man pushing behind. They were very kind and so courteous, after a new fashion, that I quite forgot that I was alone among savages. The lads were young and beardless, their lips were thick, and their mouths very wide, and I thought that they approached more nearly to the Eskimo type than to any other. They had masses of soft black hair falling on each side of their faces. The adult man was not a pure Aino. His dark hair was not very thick 
and both it and his beard had an occasional auburn gleam. I think I never saw a face more completely beautiful in features and expression, with a lofty, sad, far-off, gentle, intellectual look, rather that of Sir Noel Payton's Christ than of a savage. His manner was most graceful, and he spoke both Aino and Japanese in the low musical tone which I find is a characteristic of Aino speech. These Ainos never took off their clothes, but merely let them fall from one or both shoulders when it was very warm. The road from Horobetsu to Shiraoi is very solitary, with not more than four or five houses the whole way. It is broad and straight, except when it ascends hills or turns inland to cross rivers, and is carried across a broad swampy level, covered with tall wild flowers, which extends from the high beach thrown up by the sea for two miles inland, where there is a lofty wall of wooded rock, and beyond this the forest-covered mountains of the interior. On the top of the raised beach there were Aino hamlets, and occasionally a nearly overpowering stench came across the level from the sheds and apparatus used for extracting fish oil. I enjoyed the afternoon thoroughly. It is so good to have got beyond the confines of stereotyped civilization and the trammels of Japanese travelling to the solitude of nature and an atmosphere of freedom. It was grey, with a hard dark line of ocean horizon, and over the weedy level the grey road, with grey telegraph poles along it, stretched wearisomely like a grey thread. The breeze came up from the sea, rustled the reeds, and waved the tall plumes of the Eulalia Japonica, and the thunder of the Pacific surges boomed through the air with its grand deep bass. Poetry and music pervaded the solitude, and my spirit was rested. Going up and then down a steep wooded hill, the road appeared to return to its original state of brushwood, and the man stopped at the broken ridge of a declivity, which led down to a shingle bank and a foam-crested river of clear blue-green water, strongly impregnated with sulphur from some medicinal springs above, with a steep bank of tangle on the opposite side. This beautiful stream was crossed by two round poles, a foot apart, on which I attempted to walk with the help of an Aino hand, but the poles were very unsteady, and I doubt whether anyone, even with a strong head, could walk on them in boots. Then the beautiful Aino signed to me to come back and mount on his shoulders, but when he had got a few feet out, the poles swayed and trembled so much that he was obliged to retrace his way cautiously, during which process I endured miseries from dizziness and fear, after which he carried me through the rushing water, which was up to his shoulders, and through a bit of swampy jungle and up a steep bank, to the great fatigue both of body and mind, hardly mitigated by the enjoyment of the ludicrous in riding a savage through these Yezo waters. They dexterously carried the Kuruma through, on the shoulders of four, and showed extreme anxiety that neither it nor I should get wet. After this we crossed two deep, still rivers in scows, and far above the grey level and the grey sea, the sun was setting in gold and vermilion-streaked green behind a glorified mountain of great height, at whose feet the forest-covered hills lay in purple gloom. At dark we reached Shiraoi, a village of eleven Japanese houses, with a village of fifty-one Aino houses, near the sea. There is a large yadoya of the old style there, but I found that Ito had chosen a very pretty new one, with four stalls open to the road, in the centre one of which I found him, with the welcome news that a steak of fresh salmon was broiling on the coals, and as the room was clean and sweet and I was very hungry, I enjoyed my meal by the light of a rush in a saucer of fish oil as much as any part of the day. Sarufuto the night was too cold for sleep, and at daybreak, hearing a great din, I looked out, and saw a drove of fully a hundred horses all galloping down the road, with two Ainos on horseback, and a number of big dogs after them. 
hundreds of horses run nearly wild on the hills, and the Ainos, getting a large drove together, skilfully head them for the entrance into the corral, in which a selection of them is made for the day's needs, and the remainder, that is, those with the deepest sores on their backs, are turned loose. This dull rattle of shoeless feet is the first sound in the morning in these Yezo villages. I sent Ito on early and followed at nine with three Ainos. The road is perfectly level for thirteen miles, through gravel flats and swamps, very monotonous, but with a wild charm of its own. There were swampy lakes with wild ducks and small white water lilies, and the surrounding levels were covered with reedy grass, flowers and weeds. The early autumn has withered a great many of the flowers, but enough remains to show how beautiful the now russet plains must have been in the early summer. A dwarf rose, of a deep crimson colour, with orange medlar-shaped hips as large as crabs, and corollas three inches across, is one of the features of Yezo, and besides there is a large rose-red convolvulus, a blue campanula with tires of bells, a blue monk's hood, the Aconitum japonicum, the flaunting Calistegia soldanella, purple asters, grass of Panassus, yellow lilies, and the remarkable trailer whose delicate leafage looked quite out of place among its coarse surroundings, with a purplish-brown campanulate blossom, only remarkable for a peculiar arrangement of the pistil, green stamens, and a most offensive carrion-like odour, which is probably to attract it to a very objectionable-looking fly, for purposes of fertilisation. We overtook four Aino women, young and comely, with bare feet, striding firmly along, and after a good deal of laughing with the men, they took hold of the kuruma, and the whole seven raced with it at full speed for half a mile, shrieking with laughter. Soon after, we came upon a little tea-house, and the Ainos showed me a straw package and pointed to their open mouths, by which I understood that they wished to stop and eat. Later we overtook four Japanese on horseback, and the Ainos raced with them for a considerable distance, the result of these spurts being that I reached Tomakomai at noon, a wide, dreary place, with houses roofed with sod, bearing luxuriant crops of weeds. Near this place is the volcano of Tarumai, a calm-looking grey cone whose skirts are draped by tens of thousands of dead trees. So calm and grey had it looked for many a year that people supposed it had passed into endless rest, when quite lately, on a sultry day, it blew off its cap and covered the whole country for many a mile with cinders and ashes, burning up the forests on its sides, adding a new covering to the Tomakomai roofs, and deposing fine ash as far as Cape Erimo, fifty miles off. At this place the road and telegraph wires turn inland to Satsupuro, and a track for horses only turns to the northeast and straggles round the island for about seven hundred miles. From Mororan to Sarufuto there are everywhere traces of new and old volcanic action, pumice, tufas, conglomerates and occasional beds of hard basalt, all covered with recent pumice, which, from Shiraoi eastwards, conceals everything. At Tomakomai we took horses, and, as I brought my own saddle, I have had the nearest approach to real riding that I have enjoyed in Japan. The wife of a Zatsupuro doctor was there, who was travelling for two hundred miles astride on a pack saddle, with rope loops for stirrups. She rode well, and vaulted into my saddle with circus-like dexterity, and performed many equestrian feats upon it, telling me that she should be quite happy if she were possessed of it. I was happy when I left the beaten track to Satsupuro, and saw before me, stretching for I know not how far, rolling, sanding makirs like those of the outer Hebrides, desert-like and lonely, covered almost altogether with dwarf roses and campanulas, a prairie land on which you can make any tracks you please. 
Sending the others on, I followed them at the Yezo scramble, and soon ventured on a long gallop, and reveled in the music of the thud of shoeless feet over the elastic soil. But I had not realized the peculiarities of Yezo steeds, and had forgotten to ask whether mine was a front horse. And just as we were going at full speed, we came nearly up with the others, and my horse, coming abruptly to a full stop, I went six feet over his head among the rose bushes. Ito, looking back, saw me tightening the saddle girths, and I never divulged this escapade. After riding eight miles along this breezy belt, with the sea on one side and forests on the other, we came upon Yubetsu, a place which has fascinated me so much that I intend to return to it, but I must confess that its fascinations depend rather upon what it has not than upon what it has, and Ito says that it would kill him to spend even two days there. It looks like the end of all things, as if loneliness and desolation could go no farther. A sandy stretch on three sides, a river arrested in its progress to the sea, and compelled to wander tediously in search of an outlet by the height and mass of the beach thrown up by the Pacific, a distant forest belt rising into featureless wooded ranges in shades of indigo and grey, and a never-absent consciousness of a vast ocean just out of sight, are the environments of two high lookouts, some sheds for fish oil purposes, four or five Japanese houses, four Aino huts on the top of the beach across the river, and the grey barrack, consisting of a polished passage eighty feet long, with small rooms on either side, at one end a gravelled yard, with two quiet rooms opening upon it, and at the other an immense daidokoro, with dark recesses and blackened rafters, a haunted-looking abode. One would suppose that there had been a special object in setting the houses down at weary distances from each other. Few as they are, they are not all inhabited at this season, and all that can be seen is grey sand, sparse grass, and a few savages creeping about. Nothing that I have seen has made such an impression upon me as that ghostly, ghastly fishing station. In the long grey wall of the long grey barrack there were many dismal windows, and when we hooted for admission a stupid face appeared at one of them and disappeared. Then a grey gateway opened, and we rode into a yard of grey gravel with some silent rooms opening upon it. The solitude of the thirty or forty rooms which lie between it and the kitchen, and which are now filled with nets and fishing tackle, was something awful, and as the wind swept along the polished passage, rattling the fusuma and lifting the shingles on the roof, and the rats careered from end to end, I went to the great black daidokuro in search of social life, and found a few embers and an andon, and nothing else but the stupid-faced man deploring his fate, and two orphan boys whose lot he makes more wretched than his own. In the fishing season this barrack accommodates from two hundred to three hundred men. I started to the seashore, crossing the dreary river, and found open sheds much blackened, deserted huts of reeds, long sheds with a nearly insufferable odour from cauldrons in which oil had been extracted from last year's fish, two or three Aino huts and two or three grand-looking Ainos, clothed in skins, striding like ghosts over the sandbanks, a number of wolfish dogs, some log canoes or dugouts, the bones of erected junk, a quantity of bleached driftwood, a beach of dark grey sand, and a tossing expanse of dark grey ocean under a dull and windy sky. On this part of the coast the Pacific spends its fury, and has raised up at a short distance above high water mark, a sandy sweep of such a height that when you descend its seaward slope you see nothing but the sea and the sky, and a grey curving shore, covered thick for many a lonely mile with fantastic forms of whitened driftwood, the shattered wrecks of forest trees, which are carried down by the innumerable rivers, till, after tossing for weeks and months along with, wrecks of ships and drifting spars uplifting on the desolate rainy seas, ever drifting, 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 on the shifting currents of the restless main, 
the toiling surges cast them on Ubetsu beach, and all have found repose again. A grim repose. The deep boom of the surf was music, and the strange cries of seabirds and the hoarse notes of the audacious black crows were all harmonious, for nature, when left to herself, never produces discords either in sound or colour. Letter 35, Part 2 Sarufuto No, nature has no discords. This morning, to the far horizon, diamond-flashing blue water shimmered in perfect peace, outlined by a line of surf which broke lazily on a beach scarcely less snowy than itself. The deep, perfect blue of the sky was only broken by a few radiant white clouds, whose shadows trailed slowly over the plain, on whose broad bosom a thousand corollas, in the glory of their brief but passionate life, were drinking in the sunshine. Wavy ranges slept in depths of indigo, and higher hills beyond were painted in faint blue on the dreamy sky. Even the few grey houses of Yubetsu were spiritualized into harmony by a faint blue veil which was not a mist, and the loud croak of the loquacious and impertinent crows had a cheeriness about it, a hearty mockery, which I liked. Above all, I had a horse so good that he was always trying to run away, and galloped so lightly over the flowery grass that I rode the seventeen miles here with great enjoyment. Truly, a good horse, good ground to gallop on, and sunshine make up the sum of enjoyable travelling. The discord in the general harmony was produced by the sight of the Ainos, a harmless people without the instinct of progress, descending to that vast tomb of conquered and unknown races which has opened to receive so many before them. A mounted policeman started with us from Yubetsu and rode the whole way here, keeping exactly to my pace, but never speaking a word. We forded one broad, deep river and crossed another, partly by fording and partly in a scow, after which the track left the level, and, after passing through reedy grass as high as the horse's ears, went for some miles up and downhill, through woods composed entirely of the Ailantus glandulosus, with leaves much riddled by the mountain silkworm, and a ferny undergrowth of the familiar Pteris aquilina. The deep shade and glancing lights of this open copsewood were very pleasant, and as the horse tripped gaily up and down the little hills, and the sea murmur mingled with the rustle of the breeze, and a glint of white surf sometimes flashed through the greenery, and dragonflies and butterflies in suits of crimson and black velvet crossed the path continually like living flashes of light, I was reminded somewhat, though faintly, of windward Hawaii. We emerged upon an Aino hut and a beautiful placid river, and two Ainos ferried the four people and horses across in a scow, the third wading to guide the boat. They wore no clothing, but only one was hairy. They were superb-looking men, gentle and extremely courteous, handing me in and out of the boat, and holding the stirrup while I mounted, with much natural grace. On leaving, they extended their arms and waved their hands inwards twice, stroking their grand beards afterwards, which is their usual salutation. A short distance over Shingle brought us to this Japanese village of sixty-three houses, a colonization settlement, mainly of samurai from the province of Sendai, who are raising very fine crops on the sandy soil. The mountains, twelve miles in the interior, have a large Aino population, and a few Ainos live near this village and are held in great contempt by its inhabitants. My room is on the village street, and, as it is too warm to close the shoji, the aborigines stand looking in at the lattice hour after hour. A short time ago Mr. von Siebold and Count Diesbach galloped up on their return from Biratori, the Aino village to which I am going, and Count Diesbach, throwing himself from his horse, rushed up to me with the exclamation, Les puces! Les puces! They have brought down with them the chief, Benri, 
a superb but dissipated-looking savage. Mr. von Siebold called on me this evening, and I envied him his fresh, clean clothing as much as he envied me my stretcher and mosquito net. They have suffered terribly from fleas, mosquitoes, and general discomfort, and are much exhausted. But Mr. von Siebold thinks that, in spite of all, a visit to the mountain Ainos is worth a long journey. As I had expected, they have completely failed in their explorations, and have been deserted by Lieutenant Kreitner. I asked Mr. von Siebold to speak to Ito, in Japanese, about the importance of being kind and courteous to the Ainos, whose hospitality I shall receive, and Ito is very indignant at this. Treat Ainos politely, he says. They're just dogs, not men. And since he has regaled me with all the scandal concerning them which he has been able to rake together in the village. We have to take not only food for both Ito and myself, but cooking utensils. I have been introduced to Benri, the chief, and though he does not return for a day or two, he will send a message along with us which will ensure me hospitality. Letter 36, Part 1 Aino Hut, Biratori, August 23rd I am in the lonely Aino land, and I think that the most interesting of my travelling experiences has been the living for three days and two nights in an Aino hut, and seeing and sharing the daily life of complete savages, who go on with their ordinary occupations just as if I were not among them. I found yesterday a most fatiguing and over-exciting day, as everything was new and interesting, even the extracting from man, who have few, if any, ideas in common with me, all I could extract concerning their religion and customs, and that through an interpreter. I got up at six this morning to write out my notes, and I have been writing for five hours, and there is shortly the prospect of another savage séance. The distractions, as you can imagine, are many. At this moment a savage is taking a cup of sake by the fire in the centre of the floor. He salutes me by extending his hands and waving them towards his face, and then dips a rod in the sake and makes six libations to the god, an upright piece of wood with a fringe of shavings planted in the floor of the room. Then he waves the cup several times towards himself, makes other libations to the fire, and drinks. Ten other men and women are sitting along each side of the fire-hole. The chief's wife is cooking, the men are apathetically contemplating the preparation of their food, and the other women, who are never idle, are splitting the bark of which they make their clothes. I occupy the guest-seat, a raised platform at one end of the fire, with the skin of a black bear thrown over it. I have reserved all I have to say about the Ainos till I had been actually among them, and I hope you will have patience to read to the end. Ito is very greedy and self-indulgent, and whimpered very much about coming to Biratori at all. One would have thought he was going to the stake. He actually borrowed for himself a sleeping mat and futons, and has brought a chicken, onions, potatoes, French beans, Japanese sauce, tea, rice, a kettle, a stew pan, and a rice pan, while I contented myself with a cold fowl and potatoes. We took three horses and a mounted Aino guide, and found a beaten track the whole way. It turns into the forest at once on leaving Sarufuto, and goes through forest the entire distance, with an abundance of reedy grass higher than my hat on horseback along it and, as it is only twelve inches broad and much overgrown, the horses were constantly pushing through leafage soaking from a night's rain, and I was soon wet up to my shoulders. The forest trees are almost solely the Ailanthus glandulosus and the Selkova kiaki, often matted together with a white-flowered trailer of the Hydrangea genus. The undergrowth is simply hideous, consisting mainly of coarse, reedy grass, monstrous docks, the large-leaved Polygonum cuspidatum, several umbelliferous plants, and a ragweed, which, like most of its gawky fellows, grows from five to six feet high. 
the forest is dark and very silent threaded by its narrow path and by others as narrow made by the hunters in search of game the main road sometimes plunges into deep bogs at others is roughly corduroyed by the roots of trees and frequently hangs over the edge of abrupt and much mourned declivities in going up one of which the baggage horse rolled down a bank fully thirty feet high and nearly all the tea was lost at another the guide's pack saddle lost its balance and man horse and saddle went over the slope pots pans and packages flying after them at another time my horse sank up to his chest in a very bad bog and as he was totally unable to extricate himself i was obliged to scramble upon his neck and jump to terra firma over his ears there is something very gloomy in the solitude of this silent land with its beast-haunted forests its great patches of pasture the resort of wild animals which haunt the lower regions in search of food when the snow drives them down from the mountains and its narrow track indicating the single file in which the savages of the interior walk with their bare noiseless feet reaching the sarufutogawa a river with a treacherous bottom in which mr von siebold and his horse came to grief i hailed an aino boy who took me up the stream in a dugout and after that we passed through biroka saruba and mina all purely aino villages situated among small patches of millet tobacco and pumpkins so choked with weeds that it was doubtful whether they were crops i was much surprised with the extreme neatness and cleanliness outside the houses model villages they are in these respects with no litter lying in sight anywhere nothing indeed but dog troughs hollowed out of logs like dugouts for the numerous yellow dogs which are a feature of aino life there are neither puddles nor heaps but the houses all trim and in good repair rise clean out of the sandy soil biratori the largest of the aino settlements in this region is very prettily situated among forests and mountains on rising ground with a very sinuous river winding at its feet and a wooded height above a lonelier place could scarcely be found as we passed among the houses the yellow dogs barked the woman looked shy and smiled and the man made their graceful salutation we stopped at the chief's house where of course we were unexpected guests but shinondi his nephew and two other men came out saluted us and with most hospitable intent helped ito to unload the horses indeed their eager hospitality created quite a commotion one running hither and the other thither in their anxiety to welcome a stranger it is a large house the room being thirty-five by twenty-five and the roof twenty feet high but you enter by an antechamber in which are kept the millet mill and other articles there is a doorway in this but the inside is pretty dark and shinondi taking my hand raised the reed curtain bound with hide which concealed the entrance into the actual house and leading me into it retired a footstep extended his arms waved his arms inwards three times and then stroked his beard several times after which he indicated by a sweep of his hand and a beautiful smile that the house and all it contained were mine an aged woman the chief's mother who was splitting bark by the fire waved her hands also she is the queen regnant of the house Again taking my hand, Shinondi led me to the place of honour at the head of the fire, a rude movable platform six feet long by four broad, and a foot high, on which he laid an ornamental mat, apologising for not having at that moment a bearskin wherewith to cover it. The baggage was speedily brought in by several willing pairs of hands. Some reed mats fifteen feet long were laid down upon the very coarse ones which covered the whole floor, and when they saw Ito putting up my stretcher, they hung a fine mat along the rough wall to conceal it, and suspended another on the beams of the roof for a canopy. The alacrity and instinctive hospitality with which these men rushed about to make things comfortable were very fascinating, 
though comfort is a word misapplied in an Aino hut. The women only did what the men told them. They offered food at once, but I told them that I had brought my own, and would only ask leave to cook it on their fire. I need not have brought any cups, for they have many lacquer bowls, and Chinondi brought me on a lacquer tray a bowl full of water from one of their four wells. They said that Benri, the chief, would wish to make his house my own for as long as I cared to stay, and I must excuse them in all things in which their ways were different from my own. Shinondi and four others in the village speak tolerable Japanese, and this, of course, is the medium of communication. Ito has exerted himself nobly as an interpreter, and has entered into my wishes with a cordiality and intelligence which have been perfectly invaluable, and, though he did growl at Mr. von Siebold's injunctions regarding politeness, he has carried them out to my satisfaction, and even admits that the mountain I knows are better than he expected. But, he added, they have learned their politeness from the Japanese. They have never seen a foreign woman, and only three foreign men, but there is neither crowding nor staring as among the Japanese, possibly in part from apathy and want of intelligence. For three days they have kept up their graceful and kindly hospitality, going on with their ordinary life and occupations, and, though I have lived among them in this room by day and night, there has been nothing which in any way could offend the most fastidious sense of delicacy. They said they would leave me to eat and rest, and all retired but the chief's mother, a weird, witch-like woman of eighty, with shocks of yellow-white hair and a stern suspiciousness in her wrinkled face. I have come to feel as if she had the evil eye, as she sits there watching, watching always, and forever knotting the bark thread like one of the fates, keeping a jealous watch on her son's two wives, and on other young women who come in to weave, neither the dullness nor the repose of old age about her, and her eyes gleam with a greedy light when she sees sake, of which she drains a bowl without taking breath. She alone is suspicious of strangers, and she thinks that my visit bodes no good for her tribe. I see her eyes fixed upon me now, and they make me shudder. I had a good meal seated in my chair on the top of the guest seat to avoid the fleas, which are truly legion. At dusk Shinondi returned, and some people began to drop in, till eighteen were assembled, including the sub-chief and several very grand-looking old men, with full, grey, wavy beards. Age is held in much reverence, and it is etiquette for these old men to do honour to a guest in the chief's absence. As each entered, he saluted me several times, and after sitting down turned towards me and saluted again, going through the same ceremony with every other person. They said they had come to bid me welcome. They took their places in rigid order at each side of the fireplace, which is six feet long, Benri's mother in the place of honour at the right, then Shinondi, then the sub-chief, and on the other side the old men. Besides these, seven women sat in a row in the background splitting bark. A large iron pan hung over the fire from a blackened arrangement above, and Benri's principal wife cut wild roots, green beans and seaweed, and shred dried fish and venison among them, adding millet, water, and some strong-smelling fish oil, and set the whole on to stew for three hours, stirring the mess now and then with a wooden spoon. Several of the older people smoke, and I handed round some mild tobacco, which they received with waving hands. I told them that I came from a land in the sea, very far away, where they saw the sun go down so very far away that a horse would have to gallop day and night for five weeks to reach it, and that I had come a long journey to see them, and that I wanted to ask them many questions, so that when I went home I might tell my own people something about them. Shinondi and another man, who understood Japanese, bowed and, as on every occasion, translated what I said into Aino for the venerable group opposite. Shinondi then said that he and Shinrichi, the other Japanese speaker, would tell me all they knew, 
but they were but young men and only knew what was told to them. They would speak what they believed to be true, but the chief knew more than they, and when he came back he might tell me differently, and then I should think that they had spoken lies. I said that no one who looked into their faces could think that they ever told lies. They were very much pleased and waved their hands and stroked their beards repeatedly. Before they told me anything, they begged and prayed that I would not inform the Japanese government that they had told me of their customs, or harm might come to them. For the next two hours and for two more after supper, I asked them questions concerning their religion and customs, and again yesterday for a considerable time, and this morning, after Benri's return, I went over the same subjects with him, and have also employed a considerable time in getting about three hundred words from them, which I have spelt phonetically, of course, and intend to go over again when I visit the coast Ainos. The process was slow, as both question and answer had to pass through three languages. There was a very manifest desire to tell the truth, and I think that their statements concerning their few and simple customs may be relied upon. I shall give what they told me separately when I have time to write out my notes in an orderly manner. I can only say that I have seldom spent a more interesting evening. About nine the stew was ready, and the women ladled it onto lacquer bowls with wooden spoons. The men were served first, but all ate together. Afterwards, sake, their curse, was poured into lacquer bowls, and across each bowl a finely carved sake stick was laid. These sticks are very highly prized. The bowls were waved several times with an inward motion, then each man took his stick and, dipping it into the sake, made six libations to the fire and several to the god, a wooden post with a quantity of spiral white shavings falling from near the top. The Ainos are not affected by sake nearly so easily as the Japanese. They took it cold, it is true, but each drank about three times as much as would have made a Japanese foolish, and it had no effect upon them. After two hours more talk, one after another got up and went out, making profuse salutations to me and to the others. My candles had been forgotten, and our séance was held by the fitful light of the big logs on the fire, aided by a succession of chips of birch bark, with which a woman replenished a cleft stick that was stuck into the fire hole. I never saw such a strangely picturesque sight as that group of magnificent savages with the fitful firelight on their faces, and for adjuncts the flare of the torch the strong lights, the blackness of the recesses of the room and of the roof, at one end of which the stars looked in, and the row of savage women in the background. Eastern savagery and Western civilization met in this hut, savagery giving and civilization receiving, the yellow-skinned Ito the connecting link between the two, and the representative of a civilization to which our own is but an infant of days. I found it very exciting, and when all had left, crept out into the starlight. The lodges were all dark and silent, and the dogs, mild like their masters, took no notice of me. The only sound was the rustle of a light breeze through the surrounding forest. The verse came into my mind, It is not the will of your father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Surely these simple savages are children, as children to be judged. May we not hope as children to be saved through him who came not to judge the world, but to save the world? I crept back again and into my mosquito net, and suffered not from fleas or mosquitoes, but from severe cold. Shinondi conversed with Ito for some time in a low musical voice, having previously asked if it would keep me from sleeping. No Japanese ever intermitted his ceaseless chatter at any hour of the night for a similar reason. Later, the chief's principal wife, Noma, stuck a triply cleft stick in the fire hole, put a potsherd with a wick and some fish oil upon it, 
and by the dim light of this rude lamp sewed until midnight at a garment of bark cloth which she was ornamenting for her lord with strips of blue cloth and when i opened my eyes the next morning she was at the window sewing by the earliest daylight she is the most intelligent looking of all the women but looks sad and almost stern and speaks seldom although she is the principal wife of the chief she is not happy for she is childless and i thought that her sad look darkened into something evil as the other wife caressed a fine baby boy benri seems to me something of a brute and the mother-in-law obviously holds the reins of government pretty tight after sewing till midnight she swept the mats with a bunch of twigs and then crept into her bed behind a hanging mat for a moment in the stillness i felt a feeling of panic as if i were incurring a risk by being alone among savages but i conquered it and after watching the fire till it went out fell asleep till i was awoke by the severe cold of the next day's dawn letter thirty six part two when i crept from under my net much benumbed with cold there were about eleven people in the room who all made their graceful salutation it did not seem as if they had ever heard of washing for when water was asked for shinondi brought a little in a lacquer bowl and held it while i bathed my face and hands supposing the performance to be an act of worship i was about to throw some cold tea out of the window by my bed when he arrested me with an anxious face and i saw what i had not observed before that there was a god at that window a stick with festoons of shavings hanging from it and beside it a dead bird the ainos have two meals a day and their breakfast was a repetition of the previous night's supper we all ate together and i gave the children the remains of my rice and it was most amusing to see little creatures of three four and five years old with no other clothing than a piece of pewter hanging round their necks first formally asking leave of the parents before taking the rice and then waving their hands the obedience of the children is instantaneous the parents are more demonstrative in their affection than the japanese are caressing them a good deal and two of the men are devoted to children who are not their own these little ones are as grave and dignified as japanese children and are very gentle i went out soon after five when the dew was glittering in the sunshine and the mountain hollow in which biratori stands was looking its very best and the silence of the place even though the people were all astir was as impressive as that of the night before what a strange life knowing nothing hoping nothing fearing a little the need for clothes and food the one motive principle sake in abundance the one good how very few points of contact it is possible to have i was just thinking so when shinondi met me and took me to his house to see if i could do anything for a child sorely afflicted with skin disease and his extreme tenderness for this very loathsome object made me feel that human affections were the same among them as with us he had carried it on his back from a village five miles distant that morning in the hope that it might be cured as soon as i entered he laid a fine mat on the floor and covered the guest seat with a bearskin after breakfast he took me to the lodge of the sub-chief the largest in the village forty-five feet square and into about twenty others all constructed in the same way but some of them were not more than twenty feet square in all i was received with the same courtesy but a few of the people asked shinondi not to take me into their houses as they did not want me to see how poor they are in every house there was a low shelf with more or fewer curios upon it but besides these none but the barest necessities of life though the skins which they sell or barter every year would enable them to surround themselves with comforts were it not that their gains represent to them sake and nothing else they are not nomads on the contrary they cling tenaciously to the sites on which their fathers have lived and died 
but anything more deplorable than the attempts at cultivation which surround their lodges could not be seen. The soil is little better than white sand, on which without manure they attempt to grow millet, which is to them in the place of rice, pumpkins, onions, and tobacco. But the look of their plots is as if they had been cultivated ten years ago, and some chance sown grain and vegetables had come up among the weeds. When nothing more will grow, they partially clear another bit of forest and exhaust that in its turn. In every house the same honour was paid to a guest. This seems a savage virtue which is not strong enough to survive much contact with civilization. Before I entered one lodge, the woman brought several of the finer mats and arranged them as a pathway for me to walk to the fire upon. They will not accept anything for lodging, or for anything that they give, so I was anxious to help them by buying some of their handiwork, but found even this a difficult matter. They were very anxious to give, but when I desired to buy, they said they did not wish to part with their things. I wanted what they had in actual use, such as a tobacco box and pipe sheath, and knives with carved handles and scabbards, and for three of these I offered two and a half dollars. They said that they did not care to sell them, but in the evening they came saying they were not worth more than one dollar ten cents, and they would sell them for that, and I could not get them to take more. They said it was not their custom. I bought a bow and three poisoned arrows, two reed mats with a diamond pattern on them in reeds stained red, some knives with sheaths, and a bark cloth dress. I tried to buy the sake sticks with which they make libations to their gods, but they said it was not their custom to part with the sake stick of any living man. However, this morning Shinondi has brought me, as a very valuable present, the stick of a dead man. This morning the man who sold the arrows brought two new ones to replace two which were imperfect. I found them, as Mr. von Siebold had done, punctiliously honest in all their transactions. They were very large earrings with hoops an inch and a half in diameter, a pair constituting the dowry of an Aino bride, but they would not part with these. A house was burned down two nights ago, and custom, in such a case, requires that all the men should work at rebuilding it. So, in their absence, I got two boys to take me in a dugout as far as we could go up the Sarufutogawa, a lovely river which winds tortuously through the forests and mountains in unspeakable loveliness. I had much of the feeling of the ancient mariner. We were the first who ever burst into that silent sea. For certainly no European had ever previously floated on the dark and forest-shrouded waters. I enjoyed those hours thoroughly, for the silence was profound, and the faint blue of the autumn sky, and the soft blue veil which spiritualized the distances, were so exquisitely like the Indian summer. The evening was spent like the previous one, but the hearts of the savages were sad, for there was no more sake in Biratori, so they could not drink to the god, and the fire and the post with the shavings had to go without libations. There was no more oil, so after the strangers retired, the hut was in complete darkness. Yesterday morning we all breakfasted soon after daylight, and the able-bodied men went away to hunt. Hunting and fishing are their occupations, and for indoor recreation they carve tobacco boxes, knife sheaths, sake sticks, and shuttles. It is quite unnecessary for them to do anything, they are quite contented to sit by the fire and smoke occasionally, and eat and sleep, this apathy being varied by spasms of activity when there is no more dried fish in the kuras, and when skins must be taken to Sarufuto to pay for sake. The women seem never to have an idle moment. They rise early to sew, weave, and split bark, for they not only clothe themselves and their husbands in this nearly indestructible cloth, but weave it for barter, and the lower class of Japanese are constantly to be seen wearing the product of Aino industry. They do all the hard work, such as drawing water, chopping wood, grinding millet, and cultivating the soil, after their fashion, 
but to do the men justice i often see them trudging along carrying one and even two children the women take the exclusive charge of the kuras which are never entered by men I was left for some hours alone with the women, of whom there were seven in the hut, with a few children. On the one side of the fire, the chief's mother sat like a fate, forever splitting and knotting bark, and petrifying me by her cold, fateful eyes. Her thick grey hair hangs in shocks, the tattooing round her mouth has nearly faded, and no longer disguises her really handsome features. She is dressed in a much ornamented bark cloth dress and wears two silver beads tied round her neck by a piece of blue cotton, in addition to very large earrings. She has much sway in the house, sitting on the men's side of the fire, drinking plenty of sake and occasionally chiding her grandson Shinondi for telling me too much, saying that it will bring harm to her people. Though her expression is so severe and forbidding, she is certainly very handsome, and it is a European, not an Asiatic beauty. The younger women were all at work. Two were seated on the floor, weaving without a loom, and the others were making and mending the bark coats which are worn by both sexes. Noma, the chief's principal wife, sat apart, seldom speaking. Two of the youngest women are very pretty, as fair as ourselves, and their comeliness is of the rosy, peasant kind. It turns out that two of them, though they would not divulge it before men, speak Japanese, and they prattled to Ito with great vivacity and merriment, the ancient fate scowling at them the while from under her shaggy eyebrows. I got a number of words from them, and they laughed heartily at my erroneous pronunciation. They even asked me a number of questions regarding their own sex among ourselves, but few of these would bear repetition, and they answered a number of mine. As the merriment increased, the old woman looked increasingly angry and restless, and at last rated them sharply, as I have heard since, telling them that if they spoke another word she should tell her husbands that they had been talking to strangers. After this, not another word was spoken, and Noma, who is an industrious housewife, boiled some millet into a mash for a midday lunch. During the afternoon, a very handsome young Aino, with a washed, richly coloured skin and fine clear eyes, came up from the coast where he had been working at the fishing. He saluted the old woman and Benri's wife on entering, and presented the former with a gourd of sake, bringing a greedy light into her eyes as she took a long draught, after which, saluting me, he threw himself down in the place of honour by the fire, with the easy grace of a staghound, a savage all over. His name is Pipichari, and he is the chief's adopted son. He had cut his foot badly with a root and asked me to cure it, and I stipulated that it should be bathed for some time in warm water before anything more was done, after which I bandaged it with lint. He said he did not like me to touch his foot, it was not clean enough, my hands were too white, etc., but when I had dressed it and the pain was much relieved, he bowed very low and then kissed my hand. He was the only one among them all who showed the slightest curiosity regarding my things. He looked at my scissors, touched my boots, and watched me as I wrote, with the simple curiosity of a child. He could speak a little Japanese, but he said he was too young to tell me anything, the older man would know. He is a total abstainer from sake, and he says that there are four such besides himself among the large number of Ainos who are just now at the fishing at Mombetsu, and that the others keep separate from them, because they think that the gods will be angry with them for not drinking. Several patients, mostly children, were brought in during the afternoon. Ito was much disgusted by my interest in these people, who, he repeated, are just dogs, referring to the legendary origin, of which they are not ashamed. His assertion that they have learned politeness from the Japanese is simply baseless. Their politeness, though of quite another and more manly stamp, is savage, not civilized. The men came back at dark, the meal was prepared, and we sat round the fire as before, 
but there was no sake except in the possession of the old woman and again the hearts of the savages were sad i could multiply instances of their politeness as we were talking pipichari who is a very untutored savage dropped his coat from one shoulder and at once shinondi signed to him to put it on again again a woman was sent to a distant village for some oil as soon as they heard that i usually burned a light all night little acts of courtesy were constantly being performed but i really appreciated nothing more than the quiet way in which they went on with the routine of their ordinary lives during the evening a man came to ask if i would go and see a woman who could hardly breathe and i found her very ill of bronchitis accompanied with much fever she was lying in a coat of skins tossing on the hard boards of her bed with a matting covered roll under her head and her husband was trying to make her swallow some salt fish i took her dry hot hand such a small hand to toot all over the back and it gave me a strange thrill the room was full of people and they all seemed very sorry a medical missionary would be of little use here but a medically trained nurse who would give medicines and proper food with proper nursing would save many lives and much suffering it is of no use to tell these people to do anything which requires to be done more than once they are just like children I gave her some chlorodyne, which she swallowed with difficulty, and left another dose ready mixed to give her in a few hours, but about midnight they came to tell me that she was worse, and on going I found her very cold and weak, and breathing very hard, moving her head wearily from side to side. I thought she could not live for many hours, and was much afraid that they would think that I had killed her. I told them that I thought she would die, but they urged me to do something more for her, and as a last hope I gave her some brandy, with twenty-five drops of chlorodyne and a few spoonfuls of very strong beef tea. She was unable, or more probably unwilling, to make the effort to swallow it, and I poured it down her throat by the wild glare of strips of birch bark. An hour later they came back to tell me that she felt as if she were very drunk, but going back to her house I found that she was sleeping quietly and breathing more easily, and, creeping back just at dawn, I found her still sleeping and with her pulse stronger and calmer. She is now decidedly better and quite sensible, and her husband, the sub-chief, is much delighted. It seems so sad that they have nothing fit for a sick person's food, and though I have made a bowl of beef tea with the remains of my stock, it can only last one day. I was so tired with these nocturnal expeditions and anxieties that on lying down I fell asleep, and on waking found more than the usual assemblage in the room, and the men were obviously agog about something. They have a singular, and I hope an unreasonable, fear of the Japanese government. Mr. von Siebold thinks that the officials threaten and knock them about, and this is possible, but I really think that the Kaitai Kushi department means well by them, and, besides removing the oppressive restrictions by which, as a conquered race, they were fettered, treats them far more humanely and equitably than the U.S. government, for instance, treats the North American Indians. However, they are ignorant, and one of the men, who had been most grateful because I said I would get Dr. Hepburn to send some medicine for his child, came this morning and begged me not to do so, he said, the Japanese government would be angry. After this they again prayed me not to tell the Japanese government that they had told me their customs, and then they began to talk earnestly together. The sub-chief then spoke, and said that I had been kind to their sick people, and they would like to show me their temple, which had never been seen by any foreigner, but they were very much afraid of doing so, and they asked me many times not to tell the Japanese government that they showed it to me, lest some great harm should happen to them. The sub-chief put on a sleeveless Japanese war cloak to go up, and he, Shinondi, Pipichari, and two others accompanied me. 
It was a beautiful but very steep walk, or rather climb, to the top of an abrupt acclivity beyond the village, on which the temple or shrine stands. It would be impossible to get up, were it not for the remains of a wooden staircase, not of Aino construction. Forest and mountain surround Biratori, and the only breaks in the dense greenery are glints of the shining waters of the Sarufutogawa and the tawny roofs of the Aino lodges. It is a lonely and a silent land, fitter for the hiding place than the dwelling place of men. When the splendid young savage Pipichari saw that I found it difficult to get up, he took my hand and helped me up, as gently as an English gentleman would have done, and when he saw that I had greater difficulty in getting down, he all but insisted on my riding down on his back, and certainly would have carried me, had not Benri, the chief, who arrived while we were at the shrine, made an end of it by taking my hand and helping me down himself. Their instinct of helpfulness to a foreign woman strikes me as so odd, because they never show any courtesy to their own women, whom they treat, though to a less extent than is usual among savages, as inferior beings. On the very edge of the cliff, at the top of the zigzag, stands a wooden temple or shrine, such as one sees in any grove or on any high place on the main island, obviously of Japanese construction, but concerning which I know tradition is silent. No European had ever stood where I stood, and there was a solemnity in the knowledge. The sub-chief drew back the sliding doors, and all bowed with much reverence. It was a simple shrine of unlacquered wood, with a broad shelf at the back, on which there was a small shrine containing a figure of the historical hero Yoshitsune, in a suit of inlaid brass armour, some metal gohe, a pair of tarnished brass candlesticks, and a coloured Chinese picture representing a junk. Here, then, I was introduced to the great god of the mountain Ainos. There is something very pathetic in these people keeping alive the memory of Yoshitsune, not on account of his martial exploits, but simply because their tradition tells them that he was kind to them. They pulled the bell three times to attract his attention, bowed three times, and made six libations of sake, without which ceremony he cannot be approached. They asked me to worship their god, but when I declined on the ground that I could only worship my own god, the lord of earth and heaven, of the dead and of the living, they were too courteous to press their request. As to Ito, it did not signify to him whether or not he added another god to his already crowded pantheon, and he worshipped, that is, bowed down, most willingly, before the great hero of his own, the conquering race. While we were crowded there on the narrow ledge of the cliff, Benri, the chief, arrived, a square-built, broad-shouldered, elderly man, strong as an ox, and very handsome, but his expression is not pleasing, and his eyes are bloodshot with drinking. The others saluted him very respectfully, but I noticed then and since that his manner is very arbitrary, and that a blow not infrequently follows a word. He had sent a message to his people by Ito that they were not to answer any questions till he returned, but Ito very tactfully neither gave it nor told me of it, and he was displeased with the young man for having talked to me so much. His mother had evidently peached. I like him less than any of his tribe. He has some fine qualities, truthfulness among others, but he has been contaminated by the four or five foreigners that he has seen, and is a brute and a sot. The hearts of his people are no longer sad, for there is sake in every house tonight. Letter 37, Part 1 Biratori, Yezo August 24th. I expected to have written out my notes on the Ainos in the comparative quiet and comfort of Sarufuto, but a delay in Benri's return and the non-arrival of the horses have compelled me to accept Aino hospitality for another night, which involves living on tea and potatoes, for my stock of food is exhausted. 
in some respects i am glad to remain longer as it enables me to go over my stock of words as well as my notes with the chief who is intelligent and it is a pleasure to find that his statements confirm those which have been made by the young men the glamour which at first disguises the inherent barrenness of savage life has had time to pass away and i see it in all its nakedness as a life not much raised above the necessities of animal existence timid monotonous barren of good dark dull without hope and without god in the world though at its lowest and worst considerably higher and better than that of many other aboriginal races and must i say it considerably higher and better than that of thousands of the lapsed masses of our own great cities who are baptized into christ's name and are laid at last in holy ground inasmuch as the ainos are truthful and on the whole chaste hospitable honest reverent and kind to the aged drinking their great vice is not as among us an antagonism to their religion but is actually a part of it and as such would be exceptionally difficult to eradicate the early darkness has once again come on and once again the elders have assembled round the fire in two long lines with the younger man at the ends pipichari who yesterday sat in the place of honour and was helped to food first as the newest arrival taking his place as the youngest at the end of the right-hand row the birch-bark chips beam with fitful glare the evening sake bowls are filled the fire god and the garlanded god receive their libations the ancient woman still sitting like a fate splits bark and the younger women knot it and the log fire lights up as magnificent a set of venerable heads a painter or sculptor would desire to see heads full of what they have no history their traditions are scarcely worthy the name they claim descent from a dog their houses and persons swarm with vermin they are sunk in the grossest ignorance they have no letters or any numbers above a thousand they are clothed in the bark of trees and the untanned skins of beast they worship the bear the sun moon fire water and i know not what they are uncivilizable and altogether irreclaimable savages yet they are attractive and in some ways fascinating and i hope i shall never forget the music of their low sweet voices the soft light of their mild brown eyes and the wonderful sweetness of their smile after the yellow skins the stiff horsehair the feeble eyelids the elongated eyes the sloping eyebrows the flat noses the sunken chests the mongolian features the puny physique the shaky walk of the men the restricted totter of the women and the general impression of degeneracy conveyed by the appearance of the japanese the ainos make a very singular impression all but two or three that i have seen are the most ferocious looking of savages with a physique vigorous enough for carrying out the most ferocious intentions but as soon as they speak the countenance brightens into a smile as gentle as that of a woman something which can never be forgotten the men are about the middle height broad-chested broad-shouldered thick-set very strongly built the arms and legs short thick and muscular the hands and feet large the bodies and specially the limbs of many are covered with short bristly hair i have seen two boys whose backs are covered with fur as fine and soft as that of a cat the heads and faces are very striking the foreheads are very high broad and prominent and at first sight give one the impression of an unusual capacity for intellectual development the ears are small and set low the noses are straight but short and broad at the nostrils the mouths are wide but well formed and the lips rarely show a tendency to fullness the neck is short the cranium rounded the cheekbones low and the lower part of the face is small as compared with the upper the peculiarity called a jowl being unknown the eyebrows are full and form a straight line nearly across the face 
the eyes are large tolerably deeply set and very beautiful the colour a rich liquid brown the expression singularly soft and the eyelashes long silky and abundant the skin has the italian olive tint but in most cases is thin and light enough to show the changes of colour in the cheek the teeth are small regular and very white the incisors and eye-teeth are not disproportionately large, as is usually the case among the Japanese. There is no tendency towards prognathism, and the fold of integument, which conceals the upper eyelids of the Japanese, is never to be met with. The features, expression, and aspect are European rather than Asiatic. The ferocious savagery of the appearance of the man is produced by a profusion of thick, soft black hair, divided in the middle and falling in heavy masses nearly to the shoulders. Out of doors it is kept from falling over the face by a fillet round the brow. The beards are equally profuse, quite magnificent and generally wavy, and in the case of the old man they give a truly patriarchal and venerable aspect in spite of the yellow tinge produced by smoke and want of cleanliness. The savage look produced by the masses of hair and beard and the thick eyebrows is mitigated by the softness in the dreamy brown eyes, and is altogether obliterated by the exceeding sweetness of the smile, which belongs in greater or less degree to all the rougher sex. I have measured the height of thirty of the adult men of this village, and it ranges from five feet four inches to five feet six and a half inches. The circumference of the heads averages twenty-two point one inches, and the arc, from ear to ear, thirteen inches. According to Mr. Davies, the average weight of the Ainu adult masculine brain, ascertained by measurement of Ainu skulls, is 45.90 ounces avoirdupois, a brain weight said to exceed that of all the races, Hindu and Mussulman, on the Indian plains, and that of the aboriginal races of India and Ceylon, and is only paralleled by that of the races of the Himalayas, the Siamese, and the Chinese Burmese. Mr. Davis says, further, that it exceeds the mean brain weight of Asiatic races in general. Yet, with all this, the Ainos are a stupid people. Passing travellers who have seen a few of the Aino women on the road to Satsuporo speak of them as very ugly, but as making amends for their ugliness by their industry and conjugal fidelity. Of the latter there is no doubt, but I am not disposed to admit the former. The ugliness is certainly due to art and dirt. The Aino women seldom exceed five feet and half an inch in height, but they are beautifully formed, straight, lithe, and well developed, with small feet and hands, well arched insteps, rounded limbs, well developed busts, and a firm elastic gait. Their heads and faces are small, but the hair, which falls in masses on each side of the face like that of the man, is equally redundant. They have superb teeth and display them liberally in smiling. Their mouths are somewhat wide but well formed, and they have a ruddy comeliness about them which is pleasing, in spite of the disfigurement of the band which is tattooed both above and below the mouth, and which, by being united at the corners, enlarges its apparent size and width. A girl at Shiraoi, who for some reason has not been subjected to this process, is the most beautiful creature in features, colouring, and natural grace of form that I have seen for a long time. Their complexions are lighter than those of the men. There are not many here even as dark as our European brunettes. A few unite the eyebrows by a streak of tattooing so as to produce a straight line. Like the men, they cut their hair short for two or three inches above the nape of the neck, but instead of using a fillet, they take two locks from the front and tie them at the back. They are universally tattooed, not only with the broad band above and below the mouth, but with a band across the knuckles, succeeded by an elaborate pattern on the back of the hand and a series of bracelets extending to the elbow. The process of disfigurement begins at the age of five, when some of the sufferers are yet unweaned. 
I saw the operation performed on a dear little bright girl this morning. A woman took a large knife with a sharp edge and rapidly cut several horizontal lines on the upper lip, following closely the curve of the very pretty mouth, and before the slight breathing had ceased, carefully rubbed in some of the shiny soot which collects on the mat above the fire. In two or three days the scarred lip will be washed with the decoction of the bark of a tree to fix the pattern, and give it that blue look which makes many people mistake it for a daub of paint. A child who had the second process performed yesterday has her lip fearfully swollen and inflamed. The latest victim held her hands clasped tightly together while the cuts were inflicted, but never cried. The pattern on the lips is deepened and widened every year up to the time of marriage, and the circles on the arm are extended in a similar way. The man cannot give any reason for the universality of this custom. It is an old custom, they say, and part of their religion, and no woman could marry without it. Benri fancies that the Japanese custom of blackening the teeth is equivalent to it, but he is mistaken as that ceremony usually succeeds marriage. They begin to tattoo the arms when a girl is five or six and work from the elbow downwards. They express themselves as very much grieved and tormented by the recent prohibition of tattooing. They say the gods will be angry, and that the women can't marry unless they are tattooed, and they implored both Mr. von Siebold and me to intercede with the Japanese government on their behalf in this respect. They are less apathetic on this than on any subject, and repeat frequently, it's a part of our religion. The children are very pretty and attractive, and their faces give promise of an intelligence which is lacking in those of the adults. They are much loved and are caressing as well as caressed. The infants of the mountain Ainos have seeds of millet put into their mouths as soon as they are born, and those of the coast Ainos a morsel of salt fish, and whatever be the hour of birth, custom requires that they shall not be fed until a night has passed. They are not weaned until they are at least three years old. Boys are preferred to girls, but both are highly valued, and a childless wife may be divorced. Children do not receive names till they are four or five years old, and then the father chooses a name by which his child is afterwards known. Young children, when they travel, are either carried on their mother's backs in a net or in the back of the loose garment, but in both cases the weight is mainly supported by a broad band which passes round the woman's forehead. When men carry them, they hold them in their arms. The hair of very young children is shaven, and from about five to fifteen the boys wear either a large tonsure or tufts above the ears, while the girls are allowed to grow hair all over their heads. Implicit and prompt obedience is required from infancy, and from a very early age the children are utilized by being made to fetch and carry and go on messages. I have seen children apparently not more than two years old sent for wood, and even at this age they are so thoroughly trained in the observances of etiquette that babies just able to walk never toddle into or out of this house without formal salutations to each person within it, the mother alone excepted. They don't wear any clothing till they are seven or eight years old, and are then dressed like their elders. Their manners to their parents are very affectionate. Even today, in the chief's awe-inspiring presence, one dear little nude creature, who had been sitting quietly for two hours staring into the fire with her big brown eyes, rushed to meet her mother when she entered, and threw her arms round her to which the woman responded by a look of true maternal tenderness and a kiss. These little creatures, in the absolute unconsciousness of innocence, with their beautiful faces, olive-tinted bodies, all the darker, said to say, from dirt, their perfect docility and absence of prying curiosity are very bewitching. They all wear silver or pewter ornaments tied round their necks by a wisp of blue cotton. Apparently the ordinary infantile maladies, such as whooping cough and measles, do not afflict the Ainos fatally, 
but the children suffer from a cutaneous affection which wears off as they reach the age of ten or eleven years as well as from severe toothache with their first teeth letter thirty seven part two i know clothing for savages is exceptionally good in the winter it consists of one two or more coats of skin with hoods of the same to which the men add rude moccasins when they go out hunting in summer they wear kimonos or loose coats made of cloth woven from the split bark of a forest tree this is a durable and beautiful fabric in varial shades of natural buff and somewhat resembles what is known to fancy workers as panama canvas under this a skin or bark cloth vest may or may not be worn the men wear these coats reaching a little below the knees folded over from right to left and confined at the waist by a narrow girdle of the same cloth to which is attached a rude dagger-shaped knife with a carved and engraved wooden handle and sheath smoking is by no means a general practice consequently the pipe and tobacco box are not as with the japanese a part of ordinary male attire tightly fitting leggings either of bark cloth or skin are worn by both sexes but neither shoes nor sandals the coat worn by the women reaches halfway between the knees and ankles and is quite loose and without a girdle it is fastened the whole way up to the collar bone and not only is the Aino woman completely covered, but she will not change one garment for another except alone or in the dark. Lately, a Japanese woman at Sarufuto took an Aino woman into her house and insisted on her taking a bath, which she absolutely refused to do till the bathhouse had been made quite private by means of screens. On the Japanese woman going back a little later to see what had become of her, she found her sitting in the water in her clothes, and on being remonstrated with, she said that the gods would be angry if they saw her without clothes. Many of the garments for holiday occasions are exceedingly handsome, being decorated with geometrical patterns in which the Greek fret takes part, in coarse blue cotton braided most dexterously with scarlet and white thread. Some of the handsomest take half a year to make. The masculine dress is completed by an apron of oblong shape decorated in the same elaborate manner. These handsome savages with their powerful physique look remarkably well in their best clothes. I have not seen a boy or girl above nine who is not thoroughly clothed. The jewels of the women are large hoop earrings of silver or pewter, with attachments of a classical pattern, and silver neck ornaments, and a few have brass bracelets soldered upon their arms. The women have a perfect passion for every hue of red, and I have made friends with them by dividing among them a large turkey-red silk handkerchief, strips of which are already being utilized for the ornamenting of coats. The houses in the five villages up here are very good. So they are at Horobetsu, but at Shiraoi, where the aborigines suffer from the close proximity of several grog shops, they are inferior. They differ in many ways from any that I have before seen, approaching most nearly to the grass houses of the natives of Hawaii. Custom does not appear to permit either of variety or innovations, in all the style is the same, and the difference consists in the size and plenishings. The dwellings seem ill-fitted for a rigorous climate, but the same thing may be said of those of the Japanese. In their houses, as in their faces, the Ainos are more European than their conquerors, as they possess doorways, windows, central fireplaces, like those of the Highlanders of Scotland, and raised sleeping places. The usual appearance is that of a small house built on the end of a larger one. The small house is the vestibule or ante-room, and is entered by a low doorway screened by a heavy mat of reeds. It contains the large wooden mortar and pestle with two ends, used for pounding millet, a wooden receptacle for millet, nets or hunting gear, and some bundles of reeds for repairing roof or walls. This room never contains a window. 
From it the large room is entered by a doorway over which a heavy reed mat bound with hide invariably hangs. This room, in Benri's case, is 35 feet long by 25 feet broad, another is 45 feet square, the smallest measures 20 feet by 15. On entering, one is much impressed by the great height and steepness of the roof, altogether out of proportion to the height of the walls. The frame of the house is of posts, 4 feet 10 inches high, placed 4 feet apart and sloping slightly inwards. The height of the walls is apparently regulated by that of the reeds, of which only one length is used, and which never exceed four feet ten inches. The posts are scooped at the top, and heavy poles resting on the scoops are laid along them to form the top of the wall. The posts are again connected twice by slighter poles tied on horizontally. The wall is double the outer part being formed of reeds tied very neatly to the framework in small, regular bundles, the inner layer or wall being made of reeds attached singly. From the top of the pole, which is secured to the top of the posts, the framework of the roof rises to a height of 22 feet, made, like the rest, of poles tied to a heavy and roughly hewn ridge beam. At one end, under the ridge beam, there is a large triangular aperture for the exit of smoke. Two very stout, roughly hewn beams cross the width of the house, resting on the posts of the wall and on props let into the floor, and a number of poles are laid at the same height, by means of which a secondary roof formed of mats can be at once extemporized, but this is only used for guests. These poles answer the same purpose as shelves. Very great care is bestowed upon the outside of the roof, which is a marvel of neatness and prettiness, and has the appearance of a series of frills being thatched in ridges. The ridge pole is very thickly covered, and the thatch both there and at the corners is elaborately laced with a pattern in strong peeled twigs. The poles, which, for much of the room, run from wall to wall, compel one to stoop to avoid fracturing one's skull and bringing down spears, bows and arrows, arrow traps and other primitive property. The roof and rafters are black and shiny from wood smoke. Immediately under them, at one end and one side, are small square windows which are closed at night by wooden shutters, which during the daytime hang by ropes. Nothing is a greater insult to an Aino than to look in at his window. On the left of the doorway is invariably a fixed wooden platform, 18 inches high, and covered with a single mat, which is the sleeping place. The pillows are small, stiff bolsters, covered with ornamental matting. If the family be large, there are several of these sleeping platforms. A pole runs horizontally at a fitting distance above the outside edge of each, over which mats are thrown to conceal the sleepers from the rest of the room. The inside half of these mats is plain, but the outside, which is seen from the room, has a diamond pattern woven into it in dull reds and browns. The whole floor is covered with a very coarse reed mat, with interstices half an inch wide. The fireplace, which is six feet long, is oblong. Above it, on a very black and elaborate framework, hangs a very black and shiny mat, whose superfluous suit forms the basis of the stain used in tattooing, and whose apparent purpose is to prevent the smoke ascending and to diffuse it equally throughout the room. From this framework depends the great cooking pot, which plays a most important part in Aino economy. Household gods form an essential part of the furnishing of every house. In this one, at the left of the entrance, there are ten white wands with shavings, depending from the upper end, stuck in the wall. Another projects from the window which faces the sunrise, and the great god, a white post two feet high with spirals of shavings depending from the top, is always planted in the floor near the wall on the left side, opposite the fire, between the platform bed of the householder and the low, broad shelf placed invariably on the same side, and which is a singular feature of all Aino houses, coast and mountain, down to the poorest, containing, as it does, Japanese curios, 
many of them very valuable objects of antique art, though much destroyed by damp and dust. They are true curiosities in the dwellings of these northern aborigines, and look almost solemn ranged against the wall. In this house there are twenty-four lacquered urns, or tea-chests, or seats, each standing two feet high on four small legs, shod with engraved or filigree brass. Between these are eight lacquered tubs and a number of bowls and lacquer trays, and above are spares with inlaid handles and fine kaga and avata bowls. The lacquer is good, and several of the urns have daimyo's crests in gold upon them. One urn and a large covered bowl are beautifully inlaid with Venus's ear. The great urns are to be seen in every house, and in addition there are suits of inlaid armor and swords with inlaid hilts, engraved blades and repousse scabbards, for which a collector would give almost anything. No offers, however liberal, can tempt them to sell any of these antique possessions. They were presents, they say in their low musical voices. They were presents from those who were kind to our fathers. No, we cannot sell them, they were presents. And so gold lacquer and pearl inlaying, and gold niello work, and daimyo's crests in gold, continue to gleam in the smoky darkness of their huts. Some of these things were doubtless gifts to their fathers when they went to pay tribute to the representative of the shogun and the prince of Matsumae, soon after the conquest of Yezo. Others were probably gifts from samurai who took refuge here during the rebellion, and some must have been obtained by barter. They are the one possession which they will not barter for sake, and are only parted with in payment of fines at the command of a chief or as the dower of a girl. Except in the poorest houses, where the people can only afford to lay down a mat for a guest, they cover the coarse mat with fine ones on each side of the fire. These mats and the bark cloth are really their only manufactures. They are made of fine reeds, with a pattern in dull reds or browns, and are fourteen feet long by three feet six inches wide. It takes a woman eight days to make one of them. In every house there are one or two movable platforms six feet by four and fourteen inches high, which are placed at the head of the fireplace, and on which guests sit and sleep on a bearskin or a fine mat. In many houses there are broad seats a few inches high on which the elder men sit cross-legged, as their custom is, not squatting Japanese fashion on the heels. A water-tub always rests on a stand by the door, and the dried fish and venison, or bear, for daily use, hang from the rafters, as well as a few skins. Besides these things, there are a few absolute necessaries, lacquer or wooden bowls for food and sake, a chopping-board and rude chopping-knife, a cleft stick for burning strips of birch bark, a triply cleft stick for supporting the potsherd in which, on rare occasions, they burn a wick with oil, the component parts of their rude loom, the bark of which they make their clothes, the reeds of which they make their mats, and the inventory of the essentials of their life is nearly complete. No iron enters into the construction of their houses, its place being supplied by a remarkably tenacious fibre. I have before described the preparation of their food, which usually consists of a stew of abominable things. They eat salt and fresh fish, dried fish, seaweed, slugs, the various vegetables which grow in the wilderness of tall weeds which surrounds their villages, wild roots and berries, fresh and dried venison and bear. Their carnival consisting of fresh bear's flesh and sake, seaweed, mushrooms, and anything they can get, in fact, which is not poisonous, mixing everything up together. They use a wooden spoon for stirring and eat with chopsticks. They have only two regular meals a day, but eat very heartily. In addition to the eatables just mentioned, they have a thick soup made from a putty-like clay which is found in one or two of the valleys. This is boiled with the bulb of a wild lily, and, after much of the clay has been allowed to settle, 
the liquid, which is very thick, is poured off. In the north, a valley where this earth is found is called Tsie Toinai, literally, Eat Earth Valley. The men spent the autumn, winter and spring in hunting deer and bears. Part of their tribute or taxes is paid in skins, and they subsist on the dried meat. Up to about this time, the Ainos have obtained these beasts by means of poisoned arrows, arrow traps and pitfalls, but the Japanese government has prohibited the use of poison and arrow traps, and these men say that hunting is becoming extremely difficult, as the wild animals are driven back farther and farther into the mountains by the sound of the guns. However, they add significantly, the eyes of the Japanese government are not in every place. Their bows are only three feet long and are made of stout saplings with the bark on, and there is no attempt to render them light or shapely at the ends. The wood is singularly inelastic. The arrows, of which I have obtained a number, are very peculiar and are made in three pieces, the point consisting of a sharpened piece of bone with an elongated cavity on one side for the reception of the poison. This point, or head, is very slightly fastened by a lashing of bark to a fusiform piece of bone about four inches long, which is in its turn lashed to a shaft about fourteen inches long, the other end of which is sometimes equipped with a triple feather and sometimes is not. The poison is placed in the elongated cavity in the head in a very soft state and hardens afterwards. In some of the arrowheads, fully half a teaspoonful of the paste is inserted. From the nature of the very slight lashings which attach the arrowhead to the shaft, it constantly remains fixed in the slight wound that it makes, while the shaft falls off. Pipichari has given me a small quantity of the poisonous paste, and has also taken me to see the plant from the root of which it is made, the Aconitum japonicum, a monk's hood, whose tall spikes of blue flowers are brightening the brushwood in all directions. The root is pounded into a pulp, mixed with a reddish earth like an iron ore pulverized, and again with animal fat, before being placed in the arrow. It has been said that the poison is prepared for use by being buried in the earth, but Benneri says that this is needless. They claim for it that a single wound kills a bear in ten minutes, but that the flesh is not rendered unfit for eating, though they take the precaution of cutting away a considerable quantity of it round the wound. Dr. Eldridge, formerly of Hakodate, obtained a small quantity of the poison, and, after trying some experiments with it, came to the conclusion that it is less virulent than other poisons employed for a like purpose, as by the natives of Java, the Bushmen, and certain tribes of the Amazon and Orinoco. The Ainos say that if a man is accidentally wounded by a poisoned arrow, the only cure is immediate excision of the part. I do not wonder that the government has prohibited arrow traps, for they made locomotion unsafe, and it is still unsafe a little farther north, where the hunters are more out of observation than here. The traps consist of a large bow with a poisoned arrow, fixed in such a way that when the bear walks over a cord which is attached to it, he is simultaneously transfixed. I have seen as many as fifty in one house. The simple contrivance for inflicting this silent death is most ingenious. The women are occupied all day, as I have before said. They look cheerful and even merry when they smile, and are not like the Japanese, prematurely old, partly perhaps because their houses are well ventilated and the use of charcoal is unknown. I do not think that they undergo the unmitigated drudgery which falls to the lot of most savage women, though they work hard. The men do not like them to speak to strangers, however, and say that their place is to work and rear children. They eat of the same food, and at the same time as the men, laugh and talk before them, and receive equal support and respect in old age. They sell mats and bark cloth in the peace, and made up when they can, and their husbands do not take their earnings from them. All I know women understand the making of bark cloth. The men bring in the bark in strips, five feet long, 
having removed the outer coating. This inner bark is easily separated into several thin layers, which are split into very narrow strips by the older women, very neatly knotted, and wound into balls weighing about a pound each. No preparation of either the bark or the thread is required to fit it for weaving, but I observe that some of the women steep it in a decoction of a bark which produces a brown dye to deepen the buff tint. The loom is so simple that I almost fear to represent it as complicated by description. It consists of a stout hook fixed in the floor, to which the threads of the far end of the web are secured, a cord fastening the near end to the waist of the worker, who supplies, by dexterous rigidity, the necessary tension a frame like a comb resting on the ankles, through which the threads pass, a hollow roll for keeping the upper and under threads separate, a spatula-shaped shuttle of engraved wood, and the roller on which the cloth is rolled as it is made. The length of the web is fifteen feet, and the width of the cloth fifteen inches. It is woven with great regularity, and the knots in the thread are carefully kept on the underside. It is a very slow and fatiguing process, and a woman cannot do much more than a foot a day. The weaver sits on the floor with the whole arrangement attached to her waist, and the loom, if such it may be called, on her ankles. It takes long practice before she can supply the necessary tension by spinal rigidity. As the work proceeds, she drags herself almost imperceptibly nearer the hook. In this house and other large ones, two or three women bring in their webs in the morning, fix their hooks, and weave all day, while others, who have not equal advantages, put their hooks in the ground and weave in the sunshine. The web and loom can be bundled up in two minutes and carried away quite as easily as a knitted soft blanket. It is the simplest and perhaps the most primitive form of hand loom, and comb, shuttle, and roll are all easily fashioned with an ordinary knife. Letter 37, Part 3 There cannot be anything more vague and destitute of cohesion than Aino religious notions. With the exception of the hill shrines of Japanese construction dedicated to Yoshitsune, they have no temples, and they have neither priests, sacrifices, nor worship. Apparently through all traditional time their cultus has been the rudest and most primitive form of nature worship, the attaching of a vague sacredness to trees, rivers, rocks and mountains, and of vague notions of power for good or evil to the sea, the forest, the fire, and the sun and moon. I cannot make out that they possess a trace of the deification of ancestors, though their rude nature worship may well have been the primitive form of Japanese Shinto. The solitary exception to their adoration of animate and inanimate nature appears to be the reverence paid to Yoshitsune, to whom they believe they are greatly indebted, and who, it is supposed by some, will yet interfere on their behalf. Their gods, that is, the outward symbols of their religion, corresponding most likely with the Shinto Gohe, are wands and posts of peeled wood, whittled nearly to the top from which the pendant shavings fall down in white curls. These are not only set up in their houses, sometimes to the number of twenty, but on precipices, banks of rivers and streams, and mountain passes, and such wands are thrown into the rivers as the boatmen descend rapids and dangerous places. Since my baggage horse fell over an acclivity on the trail from Sarufuto, four such wands have been placed there. It is nonsense to write of the religious ideas of a people who have none, and of beliefs among people who are merely adult children. The traveller who formulates an Aino creed must evolve it from his inner consciousness. I have taken infinite trouble to learn from themselves what their religious notions are, and Shinondi tells me that they have told me all they know, and the whole sum is a few vague fears and hopes, and a suspicion that there are things outside themselves more powerful than themselves, whose good influences may be obtained, or whose evil influences may be averted by libations of sake. The word worship is in itself misleading. 
when i use it of these savages it simply means libations of sake waving bowls and waving hands without any spiritual act of deprecation or supplication in such a sense and such alone they worship the sun and moon but not the stars the forest and the sea the wolf the black snake the owl and several other beasts and birds have the word kamoi god attached to them as the wolf is the howling god the owl the bird of the gods a black snake the raven god but none of these things are now worshipped wolf worship having quite lately died out thunder the voice of the gods inspires some fear the sun they say is their best god and the fire their next best obviously the divinities from whom their greatest benefits are received some idea of gratitude pervades their rude notions as in the case of the worship paid to yoshitsune and it appears in one of the rude recitations chanted at the saturnalia which in several places conclude the hunting and fishing seasons to the sea which nourishes us to the forest which protects us we present our grateful thanks you are two mothers that nourish the same child do not be angry if we leave one to go to the other. The Ainos will always be the pride of the forest and of the sea. The solitary act of sacrifice which they perform is the placing of a worthless dead bird, something like a sparrow, near one of their peeled wands, where it is left till it reaches an advanced stage of putrefaction. To drink for the god is the chief act of worship, and thus drunkenness and religion are inseparably connected, as the more sake the Ainos drink, the more devout they are, and the better pleased are the gods. It does not appear that anything but sake is of sufficient value to please the god. The libations to the fire and the peeled post are never omitted, and are always accompanied by the inward waving of the sake bowls the peculiarity which distinguishes this rude mythology is the worship of the bear the yezo bear being one of the finest of his species but it is impossible to understand the feelings by which it is prompted for they worship it after their fashion and set up its head in their villages yet they trap it kill it eat it and sell its skin there is no doubt that this wild beast inspires more of the feeling which prompts worship than the inanimate forces of nature, and the Ainos may be distinguished as bear worshippers, and their greatest religious festival or Saturnalia as the festival of the bear. Gentle and peaceable as they are, they have a great admiration for fierceness and courage, and the bear, which is the strongest, fiercest, and most courageous animal known to them, has probably in all ages inspired them with veneration. Some of their rude chants are in praise of the bear, and their highest eulogy on a man is to compare him to a bear. Thus Shinondi said of Benri, the chief, He is as strong as a bear, and the old fate praising Pipichari called him the young bear. In all Aino villages, especially near the chief's house, there are several tall poles with the fleshless skull of a bear on the top of each, and in most there is also a large cage, made gridiron fashion, of stout timbers, and raised two or three feet from the ground. At the present time such cages contain young but well-grown bears, captured when quite small in the early spring after the capture the bear cub is introduced into a dwelling house generally that of the chief or sub-chief where it is suckled by a woman and played with by the children till it grows too big and rough for domestic ways and is placed in a strong cage in which it is fed and cared for as i understand till the autumn of the following year when being strong and well grown the festival of the bear is celebrated the customs of this festival vary considerably, and the manner of the bear's death differs among the mountain and coast Ainos, but everywhere there is a great gathering of the people, and it is the occasion of a great feast, accompanied with much sake and a curious dance, in which men alone take part. 
yells and shouts are used to excite the bear and when he becomes much agitated a chief shoots him with an arrow inflicting a slight wound which maddens him on which the bars of the cage are raised and he springs forth very furious at this stage the ainos run upon him with various weapons each one striving to inflict a wound as it brings luck to draw his blood as soon as he falls down exhausted his head is cut off and the weapons with which he has been wounded are offered to it and he is asked to avenge himself upon them afterwards the carcass amidst the frenzied uproar is distributed among the people and amidst feasting and riot the head placed upon a pole is worshipped that is it receives libations of sake and the festival closes with general intoxication in some villages it is customary for the foster mother of the bear to utter piercing wails while he is delivered to his murderers and after he is slain to beat each one of them with a branch of a tree afterwards at uzu on volcano bay the old man told me that at their festival they dispatched the bear after a different manner on letting it loose from the cage two men seize it by the ears and others simultaneously place a long stout pole across the nape of its neck upon which a number of ainos mount and after a prolonged struggle the neck is broken as the bear is seen to approach his end they shout in chorus we kill you o bear come back soon into an aino when a bear is trapped or wounded by an arrow the hunters go through an apologetic or propitiatory ceremony they appear to have certain rude ideas of metempsychosis as is evident by the uzu prayer to the bear and certain rude traditions but whether these are indigenous or have arisen by contact with buddhism at a later period is impossible to say they have no definite ideas concerning a future state and the subject is evidently not a pleasing one to them such notions as they have are few and confused some think that the spirits of their friends go into wolves and snakes others that they wander about the forests and they are much afraid of ghosts a few think that they go to a good or bad place according to their deeds but Shinondi said, and there was an infinite pathos in his words, How can we know? No one ever came back to tell us. On asking him what were bad deeds, he said, Being bad to parents, stealing, and telling lies. The future, however, does not occupy any place in their thoughts, and they can hardly be said to believe in the immortality of the soul, though their fear of ghosts shows that they recognize a distinction between body and spirit their social customs are very simple girls never marry before the age of seventeen or men before twenty-one when a man wishes to marry he thinks of some particular girl and asks the chief if he may ask for her if leave is given either through a go-between or personally he asks her father for her and if he consents the bridegroom gives him a present usually a japanese curio this constitutes betrothal and the marriage which immediately follows is celebrated by carousals and the drinking of much sake the bride receives as her dowry her earrings and a highly ornamented kimono it is an essential that the husband provides a house to which to take his wife each couple lives separately and even the eldest son does not take his bride to his father's house polygamy is only allowed in two cases the chief may have three wives but each must have her separate house benri has two wives but it appears that he took the second because the first was childless the uzu ainos told me that among the tribes of volcano bay polygamy is not practiced even by the chiefs it is also permitted in the case of a childless wife, but there is no instance of it in Biratori, and the men say that they prefer to have one wife, as two quarrel. Widows are allowed to marry again with the chief's consent, but among these mountain Ainos a woman must remain absolutely secluded within the house of her late husband for a period varying from six to twelve months only going to the door at intervals to throw sake to the right and left. 
A man secludes himself similarly for thirty days. So greatly do the customs vary that round Volcano Bay I found that the period of seclusion for a widow is only thirty days, and for a man twenty-five, but that after a father's death the house in which he has lived is burned down after the thirty days of seclusion, and the widow and her children go to a friend's house for three years, after which the house is rebuilt on its former site. If a man does not like his wife, by obtaining the chief's consent he can divorce her, but he must send her back to her parents with plenty of good clothes. But divorce is impracticable where there are children, and is rarely, if ever, practised. Conjugal fidelity is a virtue among I know women, but custom provides that, in case of unfaithfulness, the injured husband may bestow his wife upon her par amour, if he be an unmarried man, in which case the chief fixes the amount of damages which the paramour must pay, and these are usually valuable Japanese curios. The old and blind people are entirely supported by their children, and receive until their dying day filial reverence and obedience. If one man steals from another, he must return what he has taken, and give the injured man a present besides, the value of which is fixed by the chief. Their mode of living you already know, as I have shared it, and am still receiving their hospitality. Custom enjoins the exercise of hospitality on every I know. They receive all strangers as they received me, giving them of their best, placing them in the most honourable place, bestowing gifts upon them, and, when they depart, furnishing them with cakes of boiled millet. They have few amusements except certain feasts. Their dance, which they have just given in my honour, is slow and mournful, and their songs are chants or recitative. They have a musical instrument, something like a guitar, with three, five or six strings, which are made from sinews of whales cast upon the shore. They have another, which is believed to be peculiar to themselves, consisting of a thin piece of wood, about five inches long and two and a half inches broad, with a pointed wooden tongue about two lines in breadth and sixteen in length, fixed in the middle, and grooved on three sides. The wood is held before the mouth, and the tongue is set in motion by the vibration of the breath in singing. Its sound, though less penetrating, is as discordant as that of a Jew's harp, which it somewhat resembles. One of the men used it as an accompaniment of a song, but they are unwilling to part with them, as they say that it is very seldom that they can find a piece of wood which will bear the fine splitting necessary for the tongue. They are a most courteous people among each other. The salutations are frequent, on entering a house, on leaving it, on meeting on the road, on receiving anything from the hand of another, and on receiving a kind or complimentary speech. They do not make any acknowledgments of this kind to the women, however. The common salutation consists in extending the hands and waving them inwards, once or oftener, and stroking the beard. The formal one in raising the hands with an inward curve to the level of the head two or three times, lowering them and rubbing them together, the ceremony concluding with stroking the beard several times. The latter and more formal mode of salutation is offered to the chief, and by the young to the old. The women have no manners. They have no medicine men, and although they are aware of the existence of healing herbs, they do not know their special virtues or the manner of using them. Dried and pounded bear's liver is their specific, and they place much reliance on it in colic and other pains. They are a healthy race. In this village of three hundred souls there are no chronically ailing people, nothing but one case of bronchitis, and some cutaneous maladies among children. Neither is there any case of deformity in this and five other large villages which I have visited, except that of a girl who has one leg slightly shorter than the other. They ferment a kind of intoxicating liquor from the root of a tree, and also from their own millet and Japanese rice. But Japanese sake is the one thing that they care about. 
they spend all their gains upon it and drink it in enormous quantities. It represents to them all the good of which they know or can conceive. Beastly intoxication is the highest happiness to which these poor savages aspire, and the condition is sanctified to them under the fiction of drinking to the gods. Men and women alike indulge in this vice. A few, however, like Pipichari, abstain from it totally, taking the bowl in their hands, making the libations to the gods, and then passing it on. I asked Pipichari why he did not take sake, and he replied with a truthful terseness, because it makes men like dogs. Except a chief who has two horses, they have no domestic animals except very large yellow dogs, which are used in hunting, but are never admitted within the houses. The habits of the people, though by no means destitute of decency and propriety, are not cleanly. The women bathe their hands once a day, but any other washing is unknown. They never wash their clothes, and wear the same by day and night. I am afraid to speculate on the condition of their wealth of coal-black hair. They may be said to be very dirty, as dirty fully as masses of our people at home. Their houses swarm with fleas, but they are not worse in this respect than the Japanese yadoyas. The mountain villages have, however, the appearance of extreme cleanliness, being devoid of litter, heaps, puddles, and untidiness of all kinds, and there are no unpleasant odours inside or outside the houses, as they are well ventilated and smoked, and the salt fish and meat are kept in the go-downs. The hair and beards of the old men, instead of being snowy as they ought to be, are yellow from smoke and dirt. They have no mode of computing time and do not know their own ages. To them the past is dead, yet, like other conquered and despised races, they cling to the idea that in some far-off age they were a great nation. They have no traditions of internecine strife, and the art of war seems to have been lost long ago. I asked Benri about this matter, and he says that formerly Ainos fought with spears and knives as well as with bows and arrows, but that Yoshitsune, the hero god, forbade war for ever, and since then the two-edged spear, with a shaft nine feet long, has only been used in hunting bears. The Japanese government, of course, exercises the same authority over the Ainos as over its other subjects, but probably it does not care to interfere in domestic or tribal matters, and within this outside limit, despotic authority is vested in the chiefs. The Ainos live in village communities, and each community has its own chief, who is its lord paramount. It appears to me that this chieftainship is but an expansion of the paternal relation, and that all the village families are ruled as a unit. Benri, in whose house I am, is the chief of Biratori, and is treated by all with very great deference of manner. The office is nominally for life, but if a chief becomes blind or too infirm to go about, he appoints a successor. If he has a smart son, who he thinks will command the respect of the people, he appoints him, but if not, he chooses the most suitable man in the village. The people are called upon to approve the choice, but their ratification is never refused. The office is not hereditary anywhere. Benri appears to exercise the authority of a very strict father. His manner to all the men is like that of a master to slaves, and they bow whenever they speak to him. No one can marry without his approval. If any one builds a house, he chooses the site. He has absolute jurisdiction in civil and criminal cases, unless, which is very rare, the letter should be of sufficient magnitude to be reported to the imperial officials. He compels restitution of stolen property, and in all cases fixes the fines which are to be paid by delinquents. He also fixes the hunting arrangements and the festivals. The younger men were obviously much afraid of incurring his anger in his absence. An eldest son does not appear to be, as among the Japanese, a privileged person. He does not necessarily inherit the house and curios. 
the latter are not divided but go with the house to the son whom the father regards as being the smartest formal adoption is practised pipichari is an adopted son and is likely to succeed to benri's property to the exclusion of his own children i cannot get at the word which is translated smartness but i understand it as meaning general capacity the chief as i have mentioned before is allowed three wives among the mountain ainos otherwise authority seems to be his only privilege the ainos have a singular dread of snakes even their bravest fly from them one man says that it is because they know of no cure for their bite but there is something more than this for they flee from snakes which they know to be harmless they have an equal dread of their dead death seems to them very specially the shadow feared of man when it comes which is usually from bronchitis in old age the corpse is dressed in its best clothing and laid upon a shelf for from one to three days in the case of a woman her ornaments are buried with her and in that of a man his knife and sake stick and if he were a smoker his smoking apparatus the corpse is sewn up with these things in a mat and being slung on poles is carried to a solitary grave where it is laid in a recumbent position nothing will induce an aino to go near a grave even if a valuable bird or animal falls near one he will not go to pick it up a vague dread is for ever associated with the departed and no dream of paradise ever lights for the aino the stygian shades benri is for an aino intelligent two years ago mr denning of hakodate came up here and told him that there was but one god who made us all to which the shrewd old man replied if the god who made you made us how is it that you are so different you so rich we so poor on asking him about the magnificent pieces of lacquer and inlaying which adorn his curio shelf he said that they were his father's grandfather's and great-grandfather's at least and he thinks they were gift from the daimyo of matsumae soon after the conquest of yezo he is a grand-looking man in spite of the havoc wrought by his intemperate habits there is plenty of room in the house and this morning when i asked him to show me the use of the spear he looked a truly magnificent savage stepping well back with the spear in rest and then springing forward for the attack his arms and legs turning into iron the big muscles standing out in knots his frame quivering with excitement the thick hair falling back in masses from his brow and the fire of the chase in his eye i trembled for my boy who was the object of the imaginary onslaught the passion of sport was so admirably acted as i write seven of the older men are sitting by the fire their great beards fall to their waists in rippled masses and the slight baldness of age not only gives them a singularly venerable appearance but enhances the beauty of their lofty brows i took a rough sketch of one of the handsomest and showing it to him asked if he would have it but instead of being amused or pleased he showed symptoms of fear and asked me to burn it saying it would bring him bad luck and he should die however ito pacified him and he accepted it after a chinese character which is understood to mean good luck had been written upon it but all the others begged me not to make pictures of them except pipichari who lies at my feet like a stag hound the profusion of black hair and a curious intensity about their eyes coupled with the hairy limbs and singularly vigorous physique give them a formidably savage appearance but the smile full of sweetness and light in which both eyes and mouth bear part and the low musical voice softer and sweeter than anything i have previously heard make me at times forget that they are savages at all the venerable look of these old men harmonizes with the singular dignity and courtesy of their manners but as i look at the grand heads and reflect that the ainos have never shown any capacity and are merely adult children they seem to suggest water on the brain rather than intellect 
I am more and more convinced that the expression of their faces is European. It is truthful, straightforward, manly, but both it and the tone of voice are strongly tinged with pathos. Before these elders, Benri asked me, in a severe tone, if I had been annoyed in any way during his absence. He feared, he said, that the young men and the women would crowd about me rudely. I made a complimentary speech in return, and all the ancient hands were waved, and the venerable beards were stroked in acknowledgment. These Ainos, doubtless, stand high among uncivilized peoples. They are, however, as completely irreclaimable as the wildest of nomad tribes, and contact with civilization, where it exists, only debases them. Several young Ainos were sent to Tokyo, and educated and trained in various ways, but as soon as they returned to Yezo, they relapsed into savagery, retaining nothing but a knowledge of Japanese. They are charming in many ways, but make one sad, too, by their stupidity, apathy, and hopelessness, and all the sadder that their numbers appear to be again increasing, and as their physique is very fine, there does not appear to be a prospect of the race dying out at present. They are certainly superior to many Aborigines, as they have an approach to domestic life. They have one word for house and another for home, and one word for husband approaches very nearly to houseband. Truth is of value in their eyes, and this in itself raises them above some peoples. Infanticide is unknown, and aged parents receive filial reverence, kindness, and support, while in their social and domestic relations there is much that is praiseworthy. I must conclude this letter abruptly, as the horses are waiting, and I must cross the rivers, if possible, before the bursting of an impending storm. Letter 38 Sarufuto, Yezo, August 27 I left the Ainos yesterday with real regret, though I must confess that sleeping in one's clothes and the lack of ablutions are very fatiguing. Benri's two wives spent the early morning in the laborious operation of grinding millet into coarse flour, and before I departed, as their custom is, they made a paste of it, rolled it with their unclean fingers into well-shaped cakes, boiled them in the unwashed pot in which they make their stew of abominable things, and presented them to me on a lacquer tray. They were distressed that I did not eat their food, and a woman went to a village at some distance and brought me some venison fat as a delicacy. All those of whom I had seen much came to wish me good-bye, and they brought so many presents, including a fine bearskin, that I should have needed an additional horse to carry them had I accepted but one half. I rode twelve miles through the forest to Mombetsu, where I intended to spend Sunday, but I had the worst horse I ever rode, and we took five hours. The day was dull and sad, threatening a storm, and when we got out of the forest upon a sand hill covered with oak scrub, we encountered a most furious wind. Among the many views which I have seen, that is one to be remembered. Below lay a bleached and bare sand hill, with a few grey houses huddled in its miserable shelter, and a heaped-up shore of grey sand, on which a brown-grey sea was breaking with clash and boom in long, white, ragged lines, with all beyond a confusion of surf, surge, and mist, with driving brown clouds mingling sea and sky, and all between showing only in glimpses amidst scuds of sand. At a house in the scrub a number of men were drinking sake with much uproar, and a superb-looking Aino came out, staggered a few yards, and then fell backwards among the weeds, a picture of debasement. I forgot to tell you that before I left Biratori I inveighed to the assembled Ainos against the practice and consequences of sake drinking, and was met with the reply, We must drink to the gods, or we shall die. But Pipichari said, You say that which is good. Let us give sake to the gods, but not drink it. For which bold speech he was severely rebuked by Benri. 
Mombetsu is a stormily situated and most wretched cluster of 27 decayed houses, some of them Aino and some Japanese. The fish oil and seaweed fishing trades are in brisk operation there now for a short time, and a number of Aino and Japanese strangers are employed. The boats could not get out because of the surf, and there was a drunken debauch. The whole place smelt of sake. Tipsy men were staggering about and falling flat on their backs to lie there like dogs till they were sober. I know women were vainly endeavouring to drag their drunken lords home, and men of both races were reduced to a beastly equality. I went to the Yadoya where I intended to spend Sunday, but, besides being very dirty and forlorn, it was the very centre of the sake traffic, and in its open space there were men in all stages of riotous and stupid intoxication. It was a sad scene, yet one to be matched in a hundred places in Scotland every Saturday afternoon. I am told by the kocho here that an Aino can drink four or five times as much as a Japanese without being tipsy, so for each tipsy Aino there had been an outlay of six shillings or seven shillings, for sake is eight pence a cup here. I had some tea and eggs in the Daidokoro, and altered my plans altogether on finding that if I proceeded farther round the east coast, as I intended, I should run the risk of several days' detention on the banks of numerous bad rivers, if rain came on, by which I should run the risk of breaking my promise to deliver Ito to Mr. Mary's by a given day. I do not surrender this project, however, without an equivalent, for I intend to add one hundred miles to my journey by taking an almost disused track round Volcano Bay and visiting the coast Ainos of a very primitive region. Ito is very much opposed to this, thinking that he has made a sufficient sacrifice of personal comfort at Biratori and plies me with stories, such as that there are many bad rivers to cross, that the track is so worn as to be impassable, that there are no yadoyas, and that at the government offices we shall neither get rice nor eggs. An old man who has turned back unable to get horses is made responsible for these stories. The machinations are very amusing. Ito was much smitten with the daughter of the housemaster at Mururan, and left some things in her keeping, and the desire to see her again is at the bottom of his opposition to the other route. Monday The horse could not or would not carry me farther than Mombetsu, so, sending the baggage on, I walked through the oak wood and enjoyed its silent solitude, in spite of the sad reflections upon the enslavement of the Ainos to sake. I spent yesterday quietly in my old quarters, with a fearful storm of wind and rain outside. Pipichari appeared at noon, nominally to bring news of the sick woman, who is recovering, and to have his nearly healed foot bandaged again, but really to bring me a knife sheath which he has carved for me. He lay on the mat in the corner of my room most of the afternoon, and I got a great many more words from him. The housemaster, who is the kocho of Sarufuto, paid me a courteous visit, and in the evening sent to say that he would be very glad of some medicine, for he was very ill and going to have fever. He had caught a bad cold and sore throat, had bad pains in his limbs, and was bemoaning himself ruefully. To pacify his wife, who was very sorry for him, I gave him some cockles pills, and the trapper's remedy of a pint of hot water with a pinch of cayenne pepper, and left him moaning and bundled up under a pile of futons, in a nearly hermetically sealed room, with a hibachi of charcoal vitiating the air. This morning, when I went and inquired after him in a properly concerned tone, his wife told me very gleefully that he was quite well and had gone out, and had left twenty-five sen for some more of the medicines that I have given him, so, with great gravity, I put up some of Duncan and Flockhart's most pungent cayenne pepper, and showed her how much to use. She was not content, however, without some of the cockles, a single box of which has performed six of those miraculous cures, which rejoice the hearts and fill the pockets of patent medicine makers. Letter 39, Part 1 
Old Mororan, Volcano Bay, Yezo, September 2nd. After the storm on Sunday, Monday was a grey, still, tender day, and the ranges of wooded hills were bathed in the richest indigo colouring. A canter of seventeen miles among the damask roses on a very rough horse only took me to Yubetsu, whose indescribable loneliness fascinated me into spending a night there again, and encountering a wild clatter of wind and rain and another canter of seven miles the next morning took me to Tomakomai, where I rejoined my kuruma, and, after a long delay, three trotting Ainos took me to Shiraoi, where the clear shining after rain and the mountains against the lemon-coloured sky were extremely beautiful. But the Pacific was as unrestful as a guilty thing, and its crash and clamour and the severe cold fatigued me so much that I did not pursue my journey the next day, and had the pleasure of a flying visit from Mr. von Siebold and Count Diesbach, who bestowed a chicken upon me. I like Shiraoi very much, and if I were stronger, would certainly make it a basis for exploring a part of the interior, in which there is much to reward the explorer. Obviously the changes in this part of Yezo have been comparatively recent, and the energy of the force which has produced them is not yet extinct. The land has gained from the sea, along the whole of this part of the coast to the extent of two or three miles, the old beach with its bays and headlands being a marked feature of the landscape. This new formation appears to be a vast bed of pumice, covered by a thin layer of vegetable mould, which cannot be more than fifty years old. This pumice fell during the eruption of the volcano of Tarumai, which is very near Shiraoi, and is also brought down in large quantities from the interior hills and valleys by the numerous rivers, besides being washed up by the sea. At the last eruption, pumice fell over this region of Yezo to a medium depth of three feet six inches. In nearly all the rivers good sections of the formation may be seen in their deeply cleft banks, broad, light-coloured bands of pumice, with a few inches of rich, black, vegetable soil above, and several feet of black sea-sand below. During a freshet which occurred the first night I was at Shiraoi, a single stream covered a piece of land with pumice to the depth of nine inches, being the wash from the hills of the interior, in a course of less than fifteen miles. Looking inland, the volcano of Tarumai, with a bare grey top and a blasted forest on its sides, occupies the right of the picture. To the left and inland are mountains within mountains, tumbled together in most picturesque confusion, densely covered with forest and cleft by magnificent ravines, here and there opening out into narrow valleys. The whole of the interior is jungle, penetrable for a few miles by shallow and rapid rivers, and by nearly smothered trails made by the Ainos in search of game. The general lie of the country made me very anxious to find out whether a much broken ridge lying among the mountains is or is not a series of tufa cones of ancient date, and, applying for a good horse and Aino guide on horseback, I left Ito to amuse himself, and spent much of a splendid day in investigations, and in attempting to get round the back of the volcano and up its inland side. There is a great deal to see and learn here. Oh, that I had strength! After hours of most tedious and exhausting work, I reached a point where there were several great fissures emitting smoke and steam, with occasional subterranean detonations. These were on the side of a small, flank crack, which was smoking heavily. There was light pumice everywhere, but nothing like recent lava or scoriae. One fissure was completely lined with exquisite, acicular crystals of sulphur, which perished with a touch. Lower down there were two hot springs with a deposit of sulphur round their margins, and bubbles of gas, which, from its strong, garlicky smell, I suppose to be sulphuretted hydrogen. Farther progress in that direction was impossible without the force of pioneers. I put my arm down several deep crevices, which were at an altitude of only about five hundred feet, 
and had to withdraw it at once owing to the great heat in which some beautiful specimens of tropical ferns were growing at the same height i came to a hot spring hot enough to burst one of my thermometers which was graduated above the boiling point of fahrenheit and tying up an egg in a pocket handkerchief and holding it by a stick in the water it was hard boiled in eight and a half minutes the water evaporated without leaving a trace of deposit on the handkerchief and there was no crust round its margin it boiled and bubbled with great force three hours more of exhausting toil which almost knocked up the horses brought us to the apparent ridge and i was delighted to find that it consisted of a large lateral range of tufa cones which i estimate as being from two hundred to three hundred fifty or even four hundred feet high they are densely covered with trees of considerable age and the rich deposit of mould but their conical form is still admirably defined an hour of very severe work and energetic use of the knife on the part of the Aino took me to the top of one of these through a mass of entangled and gigantic vegetation, and I was amply repaid by finding a deep, well-defined crateriform cavity of great depth, with its side richly clothed with vegetation, closely resembling some of the old cones in the island of Kauai this cone is partially girdled by a stream which in one place has cut through a bank of both red and black volcanic ash all the usual phenomena of volcanic regions are probably to be met with north of shiraoi and i hope they will at some future time be made the object of careful investigation in spite of the desperate and almost overwhelming fatigue i have enjoyed few things more than that exploring expedition if the japanese have no one to talk to they croon hideous discords to themselves and it was a relief to leave ito behind and get away with an aino who was at once silent trustworthy and faithful two bright rivers bubbling over beds of red pebbles run down to shiraoi out of the back country and my directions which were translated to the aino were to follow up one of these and go into the mountains in the direction of one i pointed out till i said shiraoi it was one of those exquisite mornings which are seen sometimes in the scotch highlands before rain with intense clearness and visibility a blue atmosphere a cloudless sky blue summits heavy dew and glorious sunshine and under these circumstances scenery beautiful in itself became entrancing the trailers are so formidable that we had to stoop over our horses necks at all times and with pushing back branches and guarding my face from slaps and scratches my big dog-skin gloves were literally frayed off and some of the skin of my hands and face in addition so that i returned with both bleeding and swelled it wasn't the return ride fortunately that in stopping to escape one great liana the loop of another grazed my nose and being unable to check my unbroken horse instantaneously the loop caught me by the throat nearly strangled me and in less time than it takes to tell it i was drawn over the back of the saddle and found myself lying on the ground jammed between a tree and the hind leg of the horse which was quietly feeding the aino whose face was very badly scratched missed me came back said never a word helped me up brought me some water in a leaf brought my hat and we rode on again i was little the worse for the fall but on borrowing a looking-glass i see not only scratches and abrasions all over my face but a livid mark round my throat as if i had been hung the aino left portions of his bushy locks on many of the branches you would have been amused to see me in this forest preceded by this hairy and formidable-looking savage who was dressed in a coat of skins with the fur outside seated on the top of a pack-saddle covered with a deer-hide and with his hairy legs crossed over the horse's neck a fashion in which the ainos ride any horses over any ground with the utmost serenity it was a wonderful region for beauty i have not seen so beautiful a view in japan as from the river-bed from which i had the first near view of the grand assemblage of tufa cones covered with an ancient vegetation 
backed by high mountains of volcanic origin, on whose ragged crests the red ash was blazing vermilion against the blue sky, with a foreground of bright waters flashing through a primeval forest. The banks of these steams were deeply excavated by the heavy rains, and sometimes we had to jump three and even four feet out of the forest into the river, and as much up again, fording the Shiraoi River only more than twenty times, and often making a pathway of its treacherous bed and rushing waters, because the forest was impassable from the great size of the prostrate trees. The horses look at these jumps, hold back, try to turn, and then, making up their minds, suddenly plunge up or down. When the last vestige of a trail disappeared, I signed to the Aino to go on, and our subsequent exploration was all done at the rate of about a mile an hour. On the openings the grass grows stiff and strong to the height of eight feet, with its soft reddish plumes wazing in the breeze. The Aino first forced his horse through it, but of course it closed again, so that constantly when he was close in front, I was only aware of his proximity by the tinkling of his horse's bells, for I saw nothing of him or of my own horse, except the horn of my saddle. We tumbled into holes often, and as easily tumbled out of them, but once we both went down in the most unexpected manner into what must have been an old bear trap, both going over our horses' heads, the horses and ourselves struggling together in a narrow space in a mist of grassy plumes, and, being unable to communicate with my guide, the sense of the ridiculous situation was so overpowering that, even in the midst of the mishap, I was exhausted with laughter, though not a little bruised. It was very hard to get out of that pitfall, and I hope I shall never get into one again. It is not the first occasion on which I have been glad that the Yezo horses are shoeless. It was through this long grass that we fought our way to the tufa cones, with the red ragged crests against the blue sky. The scenery was magnificent, and after getting so far I longed to explore the sources of the rivers, but besides the many difficulties the day was far spent. I was also too weak for any energetic undertaking, Yet I felt an intuitive perception of the passion and fascination of exploring, and understand how people could give up their lives to it. I turned away from the tufa cones and the glory of the ragged crests very sadly, to ride a tired horse through great difficulties, and the animal was so thoroughly done up that I had to walk, or rather wade, for the last hour, and it was nightfall when I returned. To find that Ito had packed up all my things, had been waiting ever since noon to start for Horobetsu, was very grumpy at having to unpack, and thoroughly disgusted when I told him that I was so tired and bruised that I should have to remain the next day to rest. He said indignantly, I never thought that when you'd got the Kataikushi Kuruma you'd go off the road into those woods. We had seen some deer and many pheasants, and a successful hunter brought in a fine stag, so that I had venison steak for supper, and was much comforted, though Ito seasoned the meal with well-got-up stories of the impracticability of the Volcano Bay route. Shiraoi consists of a large old honjin, or yadoya, where the daimyo and his train used to lodge in the old days, and about eleven Japanese houses, most of which are sake shops, a fact which supplies an explanation of the squalor of the Aino village of fifty-two houses, which is on the shore at a respectful distance. There is no cultivation, in which it is like all the fishing villages on this part of the coast, but fish oil and fish manure are made in immense quantities, and, though it is not the season here, the place is pervaded by an ancient and fish-like smell. The Aino houses are much smaller, poorer, and dirtier than those of Piratori. I went into a number of them and conversed with the people, many of whom understand Japanese. Some of the houses looked like dens, and, as it was raining, husband, wife, and five or six naked children, all as dirty as they could be, with unkempt, elf-like locks, were huddled round the fires. Still, bad as it looked and smelt, 
the fire was the hearth and the hearth was inviolate and each smoked and dirt-stained group was a family and it was an advance upon the social life of for instance salt lake city the roofs are much flatter than those of the mountain ainos and as there are few storehouses quantities of fish green skins and venison hang from the rafters and the smell of these and the stinging of the smoke were most trying few of the houses had any guest seats but in the very poorest when i asked shelter from the rain they put their best mat upon the ground and insisted much to my distress on my walking over it in muddy boots saying it is i know custom ever in those squalid homes the broad shelf with its rows of japanese couriers always has a place I mention that it is customary for a chief to appoint a successor when he becomes infirm, and I came upon a case in point, through a mistaken direction, which took us to the house of the former chief, with a great empty bear cage at its door. On addressing him as the chief, he said, I am old and blind, I cannot go out, I am of no more good, and directed us to the house of his successor. Altogether, it is obvious, from many evidences in this village, that Japanese contiguity is hurtful, and that the Ainos have reaped abundantly of the disadvantages without the advantages of contact with Japanese civilization. That night I saw a specimen of Japanese horse-breaking as practiced in Yezo. A Japanese brought into the village street a handsome, spirited young horse, equipped with a Japanese demi-peak saddle and a most cruel gag bit. The man wore very cruel spurs, and was armed with a bit of stout board two feet long by six inches broad. The horse had not been mounted before and was frightened, but not the least vicious. He was spurred into a gallop and ridden at full speed up and down the street, turned by main force, thrown on its haunches, guarded with the spurs, and cowed by being mercilessly thrashed over the ears and eyes with the piece of board till he was blinded with blood. Whenever he tried to stop from exhaustion, he was spurred, jerked, and flogged, till at last, covered with steam, foam, and blood, and with blood running from his mouth and splashing the road, he reeled, staggered, and fell, the rider dexterously disengaging himself. As soon as he was able to stand, he was allowed to crawl into a shed where he was kept without food till morning, when a child could do anything with him. He was broken, effectually spirit-broken, useless for the rest of his life. It was a brutal and brutalizing exhibition, as triumphs of brute force always are. Letter 39, Part 2 This morning I left early in the Kuruma with two kind and delightful savages. The road being much broken by the rains, I had to get out frequently, and every time I got in again they put my air pillow behind me and covered me up in a blanket, and when we got to a rough river one made a step of his back by which I mounted their horse, and gave me nooses of rope to hold on by and the other held my arm to keep me steady, and they would not let me walk up or down any of the hills. What a blessing it is, that amidst the confusion of tongues, the language of kindness and courtesy is universally understood, and that a kindly smile on a savage face is as intelligible as on that of one's own countrymen. They had never drawn a kuruma, and were as pleased as children when I showed them how to balance the shafts. They were not without the capacity to originate ideas, for, when they were tired of the frolic of pulling, they attached the kuruma by ropes to the horse, which one of them rode at a scramble, while the other merely ran in the shafts to keep them level. This is an excellent plan. Horobetsu is a fishing station of antique and decayed aspect, with eighteen Japanese and forty-seven Aino houses. The latter are much larger than at Shiraoi, and their very steep roofs are beautifully constructed. It was a miserable day, with fog concealing the mountains and lying heavily on the sea, but as no one expected rain, I sent the kuruma back to Mororan and secured horses. 
On principle, I always go to the coral myself, to choose animals, if possible, without sore backs, but the choice is often between one with a mere raw and others which have holes in their backs into which I could put my hand, or altogether uncovered spines. The practice does no immediate good, but by showing the Japanese that foreign opinion condemns these cruelties, an amendment may eventually be brought about. At Horobetsu, among twenty horses, there was not one that I would take. I should like to have had them all shot. They are cheap and abundant, and are of no account. They drove a number more down from the hills, and I chose the largest and finest horse I have seen in Japan, with some spirit and action, but I soon found that he had tender feet. We shortly left the high road, and in torrents of rain turned off on unbeaten tracks, which led us through a very bad swamp and some much swollen and very rough rivers into the mountains, where we followed a worn-out track for eight miles. It was literally foul weather, dark and still, with a brown mist and rain falling in sheets. I threw my paper waterproof away as useless, my clothes were of course soaked, and it was with much difficulty that I kept my shomon and paper money from being reduced to pulp. Typhoons are not known so far north as Yezo, but it was what they call a typhoon rain without the typhoon, and in no time it turned the streams into torrents barely fordable, and tore up such of a road as there is, which has its best as a mere water channel. Torrents, bringing down tolerable-sized stones, tore down the track, and when the horses had been struck two or three times by these, it was with difficulty that they could be induced to face the rushing water. Constantly in a pass, the water had gradually cut a track several feet deep between steep banks, and the only possible walking place was a stony gash not wide enough for the two feet of a horse alongside of each other down which water and stones were rushing from behind, with all manner of trailers matted overhead, and between avoiding being strangled and attempting to keep a tender-footed horse on his legs, the ride was a very severe one. The poor animal fell five times from stepping on stones, and in one of his falls twisted my left wrist badly. I thought of the many people who envied me my tour in Japan, and wondered whether they would envy me that ride. After this had gone on for four hours, the track, with a sudden dip over a hillside, came down on old Mororan, a village of thirty Aino and nine Japanese houses, very unpromising looking, although exquisitely situated on the rim of a lovely cove. The Aino huts were small and poor, with an unusual number of bear skulls on poles, and the village consisted mainly of two long dilapidated buildings in which a number of men were mending nets. It looked a decaying place of low, mean lives. But at a merchant's there was one delightful room with two translucent sides, one opening on the village, the other looking to the sea down a short, steep slope, on which is a quaint little garden with dwarfed fir trees in pots, a few balsams, and the red cabbage grown with much pride as a foliage plant. It is nearly midnight, but my bed and bedding are so wet that I am still sitting up and drying them, patch by patch, with tedious slowness, on a wooden frame placed over a charcoal brazier, which has given my room the dryness and warmth which are needed when a person has been for many hours in soaked clothing, and has nothing really dry to put on. Ito bought a chicken for my supper, but when he was going to kill it, an hour later its owner in much grief returned the money, saying she had brought it up and could not bear to see it killed. This is a wild, outlandish place, but an intuition tells me that it is beautiful. The ocean at present is thundering up the beach with the sullen force of a heavy ground swell, and the rain is still falling in torrents.' 